we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. My name is Dave Scott. The snow is starting to melt, and I am feeling good tonight. Good to have you all with us. Lon Strickler takes over Strange Days tonight, and I couldn't think of a better man to fill in for the big shoes of the late, great Butch Witkowski. We'll get into that momentarily, but first, let us say hello to everyone in our chat room so far. Race fan, the newest wrench in the gold medal position. Acreon takes home the silver. With the bronze medal tonight, it's Nightmare. Grandpa Holland, how are you? Nicola, nice to see you. The gorgeous Cosmic Fleur. Skin Fapper, what's going on? Yes, we'll take the blame for you staying up late, of course. Gorgeous Ozzy Ange, how are you? Mama Susan, nice to see you as we continue on with Roll Call. The Michael Leger is here, everyone. The Michael Leger. Mennonite Abe, Obi Flett, Jack Clark, good to see you all. And uh, Ms. Fidgety Aura is looking gorgeous tonight, and that's why she's going to sign autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Jack Clark, always a pleasure to have you here. And there's Luscious Jewels. Nice to see you, my friend. So we continue on with Roll Call here. Double Tim, thank you for joining us. Double Tim will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio to the right of the studio. All right, Snakes on a UFO, good to have you back here, buddy. Hope you're having a good day. All right, the ha birthday girl, there she is, the lovely Nikki. Happy birthday, my dear. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nikki. Happy birthday to you. There you go. Love you, dear. Thank you for coming on in. All right, moving on, Bigfoot, Michigan, Rob. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandma. Congratulations to you and your family, Sandra, on your beautiful granddaughter that was just born yesterday. I saw the pictures. She is just perfect, just perfect. Give, us a, give her a little hug from Uncle Dave, if you don't mind. We'd appreciate that. The gorgeous Catherine Splashington. How are you? Thanks for coming on in. Uh, Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby. There he is. All right, moving on here. Disco Stew, always a pleasure to have you here. And there's Mark Longoria supporting the Ukraine. All right, continue on here with our roll call. And who do we got next up on the list? Oh, Double Tim, thank you so much for that amazing super chat. Really do appreciate it, man. Way too kind. I know you love Butch. I know you love Lon. And I know you love this show. So thank you for your amazing support of Spaced Out Radio, Tim. Thank you so much. Billy Dink. Yeah, Billy Dink. I didn't say D-I-N-K. I said D-E-N-K, Dink. I love it. Uh, from Woodstock, Illinois. Welcome to our channel. How are you, man? Thank you for joining us. All right. Uh, who else do we have here? Digger Dog. Grumpy Troll. What's happening? Thank you for coming on in. There's our man, Latro. Vixen Doe. Welcome to SOR Chat for the first time. Thank you. For joining us and uh who else do we have here uh we got 5900 buck we got noble patrick simon condon the gorgeous pam mcsee bob birkins how are you buddy go 66 boo uh jenny how are you gorgeous mr lurks a lot thanks for coming on in the gorgeous and talented kira enzo what's happening m coons it's been a while how you doing jesse peak good to see you buddy 
as we continue on with Roll Call. The gorgeous Aunt Edna. Stephen Edmund, good to see you. Drew Boris, thanks for coming on in. And uh, will we have enough time? Ed Clater's here. The Ed Clater. Hi, George Almaraz. How are you, man? Media Fox, good to see you. Steve Wolf, always a pleasure as we continue on with Roll Call. We're going to have enough time. I think we are. All right. Let's see. Terry Brown, nice to have you here. Reptalian, what's happening? What's going on? Uh, Jazzy Small, welcome to SOR Chat. And who else we have here? <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe we won't make it. Uh, it was that birthday song. That's what killed it. The birthday song, but it was so worth it. All right. 15 seconds. Can we do it? Can we do it? Boom to gorgeous Bama. And uh, I think that might be about it because we're caught up. We made it. All right. Favor time. Horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash based out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Yeah, we have a great show for you tonight. Lon Strickler starts a new era of strange days with his cryptid adventures. Hour three, we got another great story from the swamp, courtesy of Swamp Dweller. Fedora John is back with the UFO report. Shirky Poo's got the news and the thought of the day. Tonight, we begin a brand new era of Spaced Out Radio with strange days. And of course, it is with heavy hearts, but we must always look forward. As our new monthly contributor, Lon Strickler, joins us from phantomsandmonsters.com. Of course, we do love having Lon here. He's an amazing and perfect fit to what we do and to take over from his best friend and ours, Butch Witkowski, whom we lost back on January 13th. Lon is no stranger to the cryptid world, and he's been chasing down monsters for almost two decades, including being at the forefront of all of these Mothman sightings around Chicago. He is the author of nine books, which can be found on Amazon, and he also hosts a great podcast on YouTube called Phantoms and Monsters, which we encourage all of you to go and check out and hit that subscribe button. Lon Strickler, it's a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio, my friend. Fill in big shoes. I know you know that. I know I know that. The fans know that. But if anybody could do it, it's you. How are you, my friend? I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me, Dave. Oh, this is just great. <laughs> you know, a new era. I, I I don't get a lot of new around here, man. Uh, how excited are you about joining the family here like this on a monthly basis? Oh, well, it's good to be here. I always like coming on with you, and this is perfect. I think it's going to be great. It's going to be a good fit. And, and you know what? We're going to continue with the weird, amazing stories, you know, maybe from a little bit of a different angle. I mean, let's face it. You're not as cranky as Butch. You're not. <laughs> you're a little bit more lovable, you know, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure out a way over time as we get used to each other on how to crank you up a little bit and get you a little frosty at times. That, that's what we need. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Now, you are somebody who has been doing this a long time, and nothing really, really peaks, you know, bugs you anymore. Nothing really scares you anymore. I mean, from, from Mothman to Bigfoot to Dogman to ghosts and aliens and everything in between. For people who may not know a lot about you, Lon, who is Lon Strickler, and how much do you love this field? 
Well, I was kind of born into it. I'm intuitive. I kind of uh, cut my teeth on the paranormal when I was young. Uh, didn't quite understand it at the time. Had some pretty interesting encounters when I was younger, especially I had one in Gettysburg. And when I was nine years old, that kind of that kind of sealed the deal for me where I knew there were some things that were different about me. Um, but, it, you know, I didn't really say much about it. I didn't. Uh, my parents didn't have any clue as to what was going on with me. Uh, you know, I, uh, when I was growing, you know, I was growing up in the late sixties when I had this encounter, the first, you know, when I had this encounter the first time. So, um, I went through high school and after I got out of high school in 76, I started doing paranormal investigations, you know, which was, you know, that was kind of, people thought you were crazy back there when you mentioned that to them. But word of mouth, I was just doing investigations of homes, personal investigations, businesses and such. Uh, I moved down to Maryland, lived down there for about 40 years. Had a Bigfoot encounter in 1981 down in Sykesville, Maryland. Had a uh, winged humanoid encounter in 1988 here in Pennsylvania, not far from where I live now. And then I started was writing and investigating for, for certain people. I was actually contributing to some blogs down in Maryland when uh, people talked me into doing my own blog. And in, 19, in 2005, I started Phantoms of Monsters, and it's grown since. And, uh, you know, I've written nine books, and I uh, involved with the Phantoms of Monsters 14 research team where we have uh, 12 investigators currently in 25 affiliates and we try to put boots on the ground for every case we get some of the stories that you have followed over the years seem so crazy and so impossible to be real yet these are encounters that normal everyday people like you and me are having they didn't want to see this they didn't expect to see this lawn out of all the creatures that you have heard over the years, and there's been dozens, at any point have you drawn the line and just said, you know what, this doesn't sound very real to me? Have you ever had that happen? Well, I, <laughs> I, I have questioned a lot of these encounters early on in the investigations. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I, I have dropped very few of them. Uh, it seems as time goes on, you keep working at it, you keep going into it and start following up on things. Usually you come up with something more interesting than what you originally thought was happening, which is what personally happened with this, what's going on in Chicago. Uh, we had no idea what was going on there. And that time I... has, yeah, go ahead. Would I be wrong in saying then that, you know, the minute you get one sighting, and you put it up there, all of a sudden, all of these people who've been silent for maybe months, years, decades, all of a sudden come and say, you know what? This person's telling the truth. I've actually seen this. I didn't want to be loud about it. I thought it was my imagination. It's made me sick to my stomach over the years. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because, um, like I said, I had this winged humanoid encounter in 1988. <clears throat> had no idea what the hell I, you know, what I encountered, what I saw with two other people. Um, I kind of likened it to the Mothman of Point Pleasant at the time, but it was different. And um, as time went on, I looked into the phenomena, didn't really say a whole lot about it. Actually, I didn't go public with it for about t actually 20 years later when I was on the blog. Uh, and when I did that, I started getting, um, start getting reports of people seeing the same thing on the same Creek. Uh, really? and then invariably starting in 2011, then more so starting in 2017, these stuff sightings in Chicago, it, it turned out much of what we've been getting is very similar to what I had as far as the encounter. So, I mean, you explain that. I don't know. Was I predestined to get these reports to do work into this 
this phenomena? I don't know, but it just seems that way. It does seem that way indeed. I mean, then this kind of goes back to my question that nothing really shocks you anymore because you've been there, you've done that, you've heard all of these wacky, crazy stories that you've got multiple reports on. Out of all the creatures that you have dealt with over the years, and I know you're big on Mothman and, and the bipedal canines, but is there one out there that you, you just look at and you're like, how the hell could this thing be real? How could people be seeing this? Well, you just mentioned those two, and those two are probably the, the most unbelievable, to be honest with you. Um, I, I wouldn't want to come up, you know, in front of one of those uh, those canines. I mean, you know, I, I, I just, you know, just from the descriptions that we get from witnesses, I wouldn't want to encounter, encounter one of these things. And, um, I mean, I don't mind, I'd see one at a distance, but I wouldn't want to be up close to it. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're, they're aggressive, but they stand their ground and, um, they're quite frightening. I mean, just from what the descriptions we got and, uh, but I'm honestly, you know, you, you think about the big three, you know, with the big foot, upright canines, the winged humanoids. Then, of course, when you get involved with UFO and especially alien encounters and, and abductions, and I've been looking into that phenomena for over 30 years now, and I've had, you know, I've actually <laughs> had some strange encounters myself and as well as to talk to people who were experiencers. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I kind of you know, I uh, I don't really expect things to happen, but they just seem to happen. Is there an area where we can expect more things to happen than others? You know, I mean, Ohio always seems to have weirdness. West Virginia seems to have weirdness. British Columbia seems to have a lot of high strangeness. Mm -hmm. You know, do you look for patterns like that? You do. Yeah, you do. I, I think... Uh, Besides being in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in the U.S., uh, it seems like the um, what people call the Rust Belt seems to be the emerging area as far as a lot of phenomena. And I'm talking about Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Michigan. I mean Michigan and um, and Wisconsin. They seem to. It, you know, those those states seem to have a lot of overall activity, you know, uh, even going down as far south as Kentucky. I mean, that it just seems to be the emerging area. Of course, we've always had a lot of strangers in Florida and along the Gulf Coast over into Texas. But uh, the Mid-Atlantic over into the upper Midwest seems to be the, the emerging areas now. Is it a is it a a type of migration that we're seeing, or people paying more attention? I, you know, I think it's uh, people actually paying more attention and coming forth, uh, being less apprehensive about reporting these sightings. Uh, you know, Butch and I had always thought that there may be some type of migration involved with the the upright canines. I don't know if that's the case. It very well could be, but. Uh, I'm not really sure of that we've talked about the Bigfoot possibly migrating in small areas, but I, I don't really see any real long distance migrating for these cryptids. Even if, I mean, you know, I don't even know if these cryptids for the most part, are indigenous beings, they, you know, a lot of the sightings we get are fleeting sightings. Uh, not a lot of evidence, physical evidence. You know, I, I kind of, go onto the side of possibility of these cryptids being ultra terrestrial beings with the ability to, uh, uh, come between in between, uh, dimensions. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that may very well be what's going on in Chicago and the areas around there. These, that these beings are ultra terrestrial beings, uh, and being able to come between our, our earth plane and a linear dimension, uh, where they reside at. And I think, you know, I think that's, though we have no proof of that, uh, I think more and more cryptozoologists and people that are involved with this, um, looking into these creatures, looking into these unknown beings are starting to 
believe that, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things we just don't know. Lon, you are somebody who takes reports, and yet there's a lot of people in this field who want proof. Everything is about proof, mm -hmm. proof, proof, proof. You're just somebody who takes reports and follows up the reports. It's a lot different than those who are hammering a different agenda. For those who may not understand, well, and your critics who are out there will say, well, Lon never has proof. He just takes these reports. You know, what's the difference between what you do and what other people are doing? Well, I'm more hands-on with the actual experiencers. Um, I take a lot of anecdotal evidence and, and work on that. Um, I really go in deep with the experiencers themselves. Many times it takes one of my team to go out and, and do a physical examination or investigation. Well, then we'll do that. Um, but no, I mean, you know, getting a report and, and expecting to find physical evidence is, is, you know, it's kind of relative. I mean, you know, Sometimes you may get something, but you, you still really don't know if that is real evidence related to the cryptid that you're investigating. So I try to go deeper, uh, you know, as far as what, what the person saw, what they felt, other factors that may be involved with it, other paranormal or supernatural aspects to the report, to the, the incident. Uh, we spend a lot of time on a case. We, uh, you know, very rarely we just go in and talk to somebody and then that's it. Uh, we spend a time months on these things. And I think that that's good. I mean, you offer both. You know, what do you, what do you think about this question? Because I've often asked this question to a number of people mm -hmm. about proof. I mean, Lon, your proof is going to be different than mine. Ours is going to be different than the audience's and everybody else's who is researching in this field. You know, so who, how are we supposed to know who has proof that is actually correct? Well, that's just the thing. I, you know, I, and I make this perfectly clear when I, when I do a report uh, on the blog or some other means, I, I, I lay out there what we get and let the reader or the enthusiast determine for themselves what they believe is true or not. I can give some direction. I can give my own theories, but I, I think it's, I think it's more important that the people reading the report get their own determination as to what it is. I mean, they, their theory may be a hundred percent different than mine. I mean, you know, that's fine. I don't care. That's fine with me, but uh, I, I do I don't fudge on what I get. I put it all out there and let them determine, or let them determine what it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's basically the way we go about our investigations with our team. You're just reporting this story. This is yeah. what's come to you. This is what you're putting out there. It sounds like it could be legit. You know, we, we vetted that it's a, it's a, an actual human being who is writing this and mm -hmm. look, we're leaving it up to you, the audience, the reader, or whomever. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel that's the best way of doing things. I mean, um, sure, we get some physical evidence. We're going to present that, uh, photographs or whatever, even if we, we do have actual physical evidence. But, you know, that that just ver very rarely happens. And um, <clears throat> you have to get a, you have to make, get a rapport with the people who are the, the experiencers. Uh and talk to them, not just once, not just twice, continually talk to them if there are any questions or any discrepancies. See how they make the report. See if they expound on the report um, and go from there. And, uh, you know, especially with what we've been doing in Chicago, there's been three of us who've been looking into this exclusively. Uh, we, we put it out there, everything we get, we put out there and let everybody, you know, take the evidence, take whatever we've gotten and make their own determination. You have over the last couple of decades built quite a following 
regarding your research. Why do you think these people have jumped on the Lon Strickler bandwagon regarding phantoms and monsters? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, 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 I guess, you know, I, it's, that's a hard question to answer. I, um, I just try to be real. And I think maybe some people appreciate that. Uh, if they contact me and ask a question, I'll tell them what I think about it. I'm, you know, I'm not above doing that. Uh, that's why I'm trying to expand on the, the Phantoms of Monsters brand, especially with YouTube and a few other things. we got a few things coming up. I'm, I'm going to try to make these cases more accessible to the public. And uh, hopefully, you know, people will will be able to see more and more as we go along. I've always asked you what's your favorite ones to cover, your favorite monsters, but I've never asked you the opposite of that. What reports are you like? Come on. Like, this is just, I, I, I'm so sick of these. Oh, God. I don't know. You know, I'm really not a UFO guy. That was Butch's ilk. Um, you know, he... Um, he would talk to me about a report. I'd get a report and I would, I get a lot of re UF reports. I I'd call Butch say, here, here you go. You know, you're the man here. You look into this thing. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not really into the UFOs. Uh, I probably will be from now on because I took over U4 cop. So, um, you know, we're going to be doing this as a team, you know, for what Butch did try to anyway, it's going to be not that easy to do, but, uh, and, and but as time went on, you know, after Butch and I met, he he became more interested in cryptids, and of course, he blamed me for that. But he went ahead, <laughs> did it anyway, and uh, yeah, he got into the upright canines. That was just his niche, and he uh, he went along with it. But no, I, I think I think the UFO phenomenon is probably the one that you know, I I I just don't really understand the whole UFO phenomenon, what it is uh other than a bunch of lights and how can you determine unless you've got a craft runs right in front of you and the little green men come out you know i get a lot of the um i get a lot of the alien reports uh a lot of the um inductions and such as that but as far as craft go and what this phenomenon is now nah, that, that hasn't really been my my thing but it probably will be from here on out you know what for me it's ghosts Oh yeah. I, oh man. <clears throat> Cannot stand. Like I love the ghosts. I love the topic. I love going out there, but for me, Butch, it's the people of the paranormal have killed it for me. Killed it for me. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Uh, but, you, you know, when the whole, <laughs> when the whole paranormal TV thing started coming out with, um, uh, the uh, ghost hunter stuff and all that. And, you know, I, I took a lot of that with a grain of salt and I still do. Uh, there are a few shows. I, I, I know the actual people who are involved and, and can trust them, but, um, you know, it's something that I have, you know, I've been, I've been into, um, uh, clearings and spirit rescue for a long time. Uh, I'm a trained remote viewer. I've done, I incorporate that in the cases I've been involved with, with clearing and moving on. And, um, you know, it, it, it may get boring or tiresome after a while. Cause look, it's not like it is on TV. You know, when you're working a case, you're, you're, there are times you're there many, many, many times, never even get anything. And like I say, one time you'll get something and you make a connection. Yeah. Um, but it is probably one of the most gratifying investigative things I do. When you're able to clear a home, remove an entity, and to, uh, and to know that you've helped somebody. Von Strickler's Strange Days on here on Spaced Out Radio. He's from phantomsandmonsters.com. We're going to get into some phantoms and monster stories when we return on Spaced Out Radio. That was an awesome half hour. Awesome half hour. Sweet. 
I'm happy with that. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy, man. <sighs> See, for me, it's the it's the ghost hunters themselves. Yeah. And if I didn't like monsters so much, like like uh, the cryptid world, I'd probably feel the same way about the cryptid world too. Well, you know, <laughs> you know that's all I did for a long time. And of course, until I had my encounter, I went on. But I, um, <clears throat> I have worked some pretty crazy cases as far as uh, uh, spirit energy and infestations over the years, and. Um, I mean, there have been cases I've been on for um, almost a decade working with people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, um, but no, that, that's the one thing I, the, the biggest gratification I've gotten out of the paranormal is when I do a case like that, I'm able to connect with an energy and move it on. And uh, that is really gratifying. I can I can see where that would be. Mm -hmm. I, I can totally see it, and I don't want to sound like I'm misplaying that at all because mm -hmm. I, I don't think I am. But I just look at the buff the buffoons in this field, man. Like you know, like I like to make fun of it like this. You know, like when I go to a team's website and I see the there's always this guy. Yeah, the team skeptic. He's always yeah. posting this. Yeah. Like, come on. Come on. <laughs> Immediately right there, I know, no, this isn't a team I'm bringing on. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I am hesitant bringing team paranormal ghost hunters on my show, too. I really am. But, and, the, and the reason why, and I'll be honest with you, um, I can really tell when they're bullshitting. Oh, yeah. You know, I, you know, I can pick it up. And when I started doing radio early on and, uh, Eric and, and Sean will tell you, I would just, if, if I knew they were full of it, I would just cut off and let those two take it because I would tell them, look, I can't stand any more of this. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, you know, I learned early on in 2015 when we, we weren't even a year old, Mm-hmm. And it seemed like every time I had a scheduling problem, nine times out of 10, it was a UFO, t uh, I mean, a, uh, a paranormal team who stated that they were, that they were coming on and then all of a sudden, like come showtime, couldn't get a hold of them. Happens all the time. Yeah. Happens all the time. And I don't know why it is, but that's true. I, I don't know why that is, but that's true. Happens to yeah. me too. Yeah, so I stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's that's the God's honest truth. You're telling the truth there because I don't know. Yeah, and honestly, so, I I do bring some people on like that are talking <laughs> ghost hunting and clearing and stuff, and that's when the uh, the gremlins start showing up in the radio show too because I have all kinds of technical problems. And a lot of, I, I, I kind of attribute that to me because, um, that happen, happens to me when I, I have done some shows in the past with other people, you know, when I was, when I was a guest on shows. So, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, uh, I, I, uh, I just don't, uh, do that. Oh, awesome comment of the night. Oh, Does have only fans. <laughs> I'd stuff for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That is awesome. That is awesome. Oh, uh, that's funny. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh, man. That is good. Oh, we got about uh, 45 seconds. Okay. Hmm. I want to say a big thank you to uh, 
uh, Tim and Ed for the awesome super chats tonight. Thank you so much for your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. We really do appreciate it. Hey, don't forget, Lynn Wallington has a brand new channel, YouTube channel called Rebellious uh, Ufology. Make sure you go hit subscribe on that. We want to make sure that we support her. No, she's not leaving SOR. She's just expanding her own game, which we totally support. So head to that as well. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, do us a favor and check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, as well as on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Strange Days from PhantomsAndMonsters.com. Lon Strickler is here, and we're going to start talking some monsters right off the bat. Lon, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. You Great recently... Oh, we love it when you're here, man. Absolutely love it. I love reading your reports that come into Phantoms and Monsters on a daily basis. And and I'm actually quite blessed because each day on my Facebook feed, one of your Phantoms and Monsters stories pops right up. And I want this one really intrigued me here. And I needed to ask you about this one. Mm-hmm. All right. Because this one you just took a report on from South Dakota near Mount Rushmore where a family had their daughter disappear, but a Bigfoot showed her the way back home? Yeah, that's what she said. I mean, um, I didn't talk to her personally. It was sent to me by someone else. But uh, they swear that's what her story was. Um, You know, it's, it's really not that unusual. There have been cases when kids would... um get lost out in the, out in the boonies. And, uh, later on when they're found, someone would say, yeah, I mean, a kid would say, you know, this big hairy man helped me or this and that. Uh, I, I know of one case in not too long down North Carolina that happened that I knew of another one that happened up in Washington state as well. So, uh, it's not out of, out of the question, but, uh, yeah, I guess it does happen. So I'm just going to read a little bit of their report, Mm -hmm. excuse me, that came in. It says, when I was around seven years old, my family took a trip to South Dakota to see Mount Rushmore. We got a cabin in the very back of the property for the one we reserved wasn't available. The family that had reserved the cabin before us extended their stay, so we had to take the only one available. And it goes on to say, over the next few days, some strange things happened, like we came back from an outing and all the cereal boxes we had brought were out on the front lawn. Another strange thing that happened, we came back from the pool and all of our shoes were in the bathtub with the water running all over them. Now this moves on as the story carries over. Uh, She talks about how she came in contact with this Sasquatch and it was pretty uh, tall at about eight feet, well camouflaged. He was black and dark green color, fully covered in hair. They had several minutes of uninterrupted eye contact until he looked up to the direction that would have been slightly to his left. I wiped my eyes, she says. What does that mean? What are you telling me? He looked down at me and raised his arm and pointed in the same direction like that was the direction she was supposed to go. I mean, when you hear something like that, Lon, I, I mean... As a child, how would you not be, you know, frightened out of your life and, and be able to just take direction from a Sasquatch? I don't know, you know, but it, it's interesting how kids describe these types of encounters. And, um, it, you know, I when I was talking about doing haunting cases and such, I, I have encountered a lot of cases with families 
where uh, where kids were involved. And um, it's interesting when you talk to them and they tell you what they encounter and what they see and how they respond to it. I'd say nine times out of ten, they're cool about it compared to the parents because they're unadulterated. You know, they 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 don't really know any better. Uh, even at seven years old, which seems to be a, a more advanced age, where a kid would probably understand what it was they she or in this case she encountered. Uh, I I think they uh, they take things with the I don't know a less alarming view and you know, she was scared anyway because she was out there by herself. I think she appreciated any help that she had coming her way. And, uh, you know, it seemed like this big fellow wanted to help her and that's what happened. Why do we hear sometimes with this creature, you know, according to reports like David Politis or or others who are looking into the missing people phenomena, mm -hmm. that this creature may be kidnapping people. And yet there seems to be some that want to help humans. I've had several cases where they've helped humans. Uh, I had a case in New Mexico not too long ago where a uh, indigenous lady... Uh, was taught telling me about an encounter she had when she was uh, just a kid. She was home by herself and um, she was supposed to stay in the house, but she went out and uh, she was barefoot walking outside the house. There was an old store behind their house and she used to go up there and play on the porch. And as she was up there, she stepped on a huge splinter and got in her foot. And uh, as she was sitting there crying, wondering what she was going to do, this this Bigfoot must have heard her and kind of come, come up to her and helped her. He actually picked her up and carried her back to the house and uh, set her on the um, on the steps and took back off into one of the, and back into the brush. But uh, you know, she told me that she she didn't know how to tell her parents about what had happened. And she, I don't think she ever did be honest with you, but she maybe 20 years later, she contacts me and tells me about it. But I've heard, I've heard a lot of cases like that. Uh, and, and it's normally people who have been uh, younger people who have gotten into some bind where they, they're hurt or whatever. Um, I had a, I had an in incident reported to me, where a uh, a lady was attacked by a man out in the woods. I, I think they were probably out there camping or such. And he, um, they had an argument. And he started beating on her, and uh, this Bigfoot literally came to the rescue, and he carried her about twenty five miles towards a towards a town. And uh, protected her the whole way there. Um, really? Absolutely. <clears throat> and that was in, um, I don't remember where that was now. I it, I it was somewhere out west. I don't know exactly where. But, yeah, that I've heard things like that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there are cases where this does happen. And, um, you know, you, you, you kind of, when you when you get these cases, especially with me, if it's, it's sent into me, I'm on the horn with, with the witnesses, you know, and, and trying to question them personally to see what the real deal is. And, uh, that woman in particular, she just literally cried while I was talking to her because she believed that Bigfoot saved her life. That is totally unreal. It is unreal. Do you believe, though, that, and I look at Bigfoot much like I do orca whales, mm -hmm. where you have the main pod. The main pod, if you wanted to, if you were crazy enough, you could jump in with the main pod and swim with them. The chances of you being attacked or something along those lines are slim to none unless you get close to a small one. Mm -hmm. Okay, But there's these rogue pods out there 
that will literally kill anything that comes in their way. They've been kicked out of their main pods. They've come together. They're more violent. They're more uncontrollable, harder to, to predict of what their actions are. Do you see that with Sasquatch as well? Occasionally. Um, you know, you hear a lot of different, hear a lot of different encounter reports. Um, the ones where it seems that they become more aggressive and is in a hunting situation where someone would walk into an area and, and just disrupt their hunting. They say they're there uh, stalking deer or some other animal and they disrupt that. Well, you know, you, you're taking food out of their mouth and they're going to be a little upset about it. I've heard people say that they've gotten a little threatening not that they did any physical harm, but they could tell they were upset about it. Uh, I've heard plenty of stories where, where hunters or um, people camping would go into a territory where they were probably invading what these these Bigfoot deemed as their own territory, and they would do things to uh, to try to you know move them on. I, there was one account. Uh, late J.C. Johnson and David Weatherly were telling me about uh, up in uh, in Arizona, up in the Highlands. Uh, I guess it's the Chuska Mountain area, where they had set up camp, and uh, they had a literally a group of Bigfoot, call them a pod. I don't know what it was that were at first throwing pine cones at them at night keep them awake uh i guess when they didn't respond they started throwing stones and branches at them at the tents uh until jc walked out with an ak and i think that would stopped it he didn't shoot at anything but i just don't think you got enough sleep at night but no um yeah david david told me the story as well so it does happen really mm -hmm. so how, how do you defend against that how do you know because I know up here in British Columbia, let me expand on that for a second. Mm -hmm. I know up here in British Columbia, there are a number of First Nations over the decades who have said, you know, to their, their younger women, do not go out alone after dusk. You are, there's a chance you will become a Sasquatch wife. And we've seen missing people all over. It doesn't matter whether it's the highway of tears where we can't downplay that and blame Sasquatch. We do have to admit, you know, there is proof. There is, you know, a number of one or more serial killers mm -hmm. driving that highway, but there are, you know, other people like down in the Chehalis area where the Harrison hot springs, where there's a lot of, of Sasquatch encounters around there. I mean, the Chehalis would tell their young ladies anytime after Anytime after dusk, do not go outside alone. You may not come back. Yeah, I've heard the same thing from indigenous folks. Um, even those that lived out in the Navajo reservation, the Diné Navajo, they uh, they don't like the idea of their young ladies staying out late at night. Um, but I have heard, you know, in British Columbia and the, the highway tears, I do believe some of those those cases were very could have very well been sasquatch abductions um i was told by a first nations friend of mine that they believe that about 20 to 25 maybe 30 percent of them have been sasquatch related very now well could be. and once again when we say that we're not downplaying the severity of the horrific atrocities to First Nations women up there. We're not at all. We're just going by what we have been told, or per, or pardon me, what I have been told by First Nations friends in this area and uh, where I used to live. Yeah, I, um, I think many of us folks who um, investigate Bigfoot um, will hear these stories. Uh, where um, and it's mostly First Nations will tell you about this that they they believe that uh, you know one of their young ladies was abducted and um, 
taken hostage or how whatever because i'll be honest with you i don't know maybe one instance where a, a woman came back and said that she was actually taken by one of these things i mean do do you think they're taken and and either killed or kept with them forever or what i don't know but uh I, they do, many of them do believe that's the case no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I mean, we just don't know. That's no. the problem. We, we just don't know as we move on. Let's go to another story here. No. You had a story come out just yesterday about some sort of aquatic creature at Cabo San Lucas. Mm -hmm. See, Lon, this is another reason why I tell my listeners, don't go into the ocean. <laughs> All right. This is what happens. You go into the ocean, something out there, whether it's a great white, a bull shark, uh, sea monsters that are green and slimy are going to come get you and it's not going to be a good day. Yeah. That, that, came, that instance there, that came directly from the witness himself. Um, he was down in, in Cabo, uh, several years ago at a bachelor party for his brother-in-law, I think. I don't know whoever it was, but they got all tanked up and decided they were going to go out on a, on a fishing charter. And uh, as he was sobering up, they were out. I don't know how far they were out, but they must have been out pretty far. And he saw this thing, and then he made the reference as to the, uh, the Hoovelman picture and description of this being uh, from many, many decades ago. And you know, some of the older cases too, of something very similar. It, 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 he said it was kind of greenish in color. Uh, the head was sticking out and, you know, the fins were out above the water. Uh, I, I think it could have, it could have very possibly been a, a manta ray, but to be honest with you, uh, normally they're, they're in, in large pods or schools um when they start moving so i don't know if there was a rogue manta ray or what it was but uh he seemed to think it wasn't he seemed to think it was something different so i don't know what what he encountered what he saw See, i agree with bad comic reviews in our chat room here the ocean is full of sea roaches and things that eat people <laughs> there, there's just no reason to go into the ocean no reason whatsoever you just die everything wants to kill you or eat you uh it doesn't matter how big or small it's just out there to kill that's it <laughs> you know I don't yeah it. yeah well we get a few strange ones uh you know mermaid tales and other things out there and um uh, uh very rarely we get a killer creature but you know we when we get into some of the older accounts of the uh the from the old sea captains and sailors and the attack by the kraken and other things like that you do some of those are pretty interesting uh i think a lot of them are embellished but there are big things out there we don't know about i think oh yeah well did you ever hear the story a number of years ago about the disneyland cruise line that had a sea monster collide with it and apparently it had the body of a, of a whale with the head, like an alligator. And it was the, the guy who saw it, uh, had been a part of that crew for a number of years. He was quite a leader and he was just happy to be outside for a cigarette. And he said it was about 50 feet long and he'd seen all sorts of whales over his time at sea. And this was nothing like he ever saw before. I mean, this is the kind of stuff, Lon, that just, I'm going to be honest with you, it keeps me up at night. It keeps <laughs> me up at night. Lon, I'm going to tell you, I don't even go to Universal Studios because when you take the tour and you got to drive through the Jaws section and Jaws comes up to, to try and grab you, that's a giant nope for me. Yeah, that's giant. not my bag. No. Nope. <clears throat> it's not there. Just stay away from the ocean, people. I think Lon agrees with me. Stay away from the ocean. Nothing good comes out of the ocean. All right? And let's continue on here. I want to get one more in here before we uh, go to the hour. we got about four minutes left. This is a report from a few days ago about a dark, blurry figure 
in Pembrokeshire, Wales. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Um, <clears throat> I don't know what they saw. Um, there were three sightings of something that had been crossing a, a nearby highway uh, in this in this town in uh, Pembrokeshire in uh, southern Wales. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it was. It could was it a spirit energy or was it uh, what people call a shadow person? Was it even a cryptid? I don't know. But it, you know, I, I went back and, and tried to index other similar sightings, but I couldn't find anything from that area. So uh, there really wasn't an explanation as to what it was. But you know, these things come in multiples many times, and. Uh, I kind of believe it was probably a shadow shadow being, uh, for whatever reason, uh, that was showing up some type of residual. Uh, though it was in different parts of the road, one was north of town, one was south of town. So, when you hear of reports like that, I mean, you have enough paranormal experience to figure out whether that would be a spirit that was caught, or whether that was some sort of different type of deity or entity. What do you think? I, I think it was probably residual energy, uh, something that just had the right conditions to where it was seen. Um, it does happen. Um, I live near Gettysburg Battlefield. You get a lot of the sightings on the battlefield are residual. In other words, it's almost like the energy is imprinted on on the, the, the location, the geography, of the, and it just keeps showing up here and there. Uh, it doesn't show up all the time. It, if the conditions are right, it usually will show up. And uh, there have been, I've seen several, uh, several uh, uh, apparitions that have shown up at different times for years out there. And, you know, it's funny because they had one out there uh, around a cannon, which was up by off of uh, Hex Mill Road. And I, <laughs> I've seen that thing before. I'd seen that thing 10 years ago and, you know, they're making a big deal out of it in the press, but that it, it's an, it's a Southern uh, artillery uh, soldier that keeps showing up where in, in these, these, um, these cannons are not the, the actual cannons, but it shows up where the artillery uh, uh, were set up at. It was actually part of uh, general Rhodes artillery in the CSA. So, uh, yeah, it does show up and that happens a lot out there. Can't hear you, Dave. I'm sorry. The <laughs> hauntings are, are a lot more, are a lot more yeah. frequent than what we think, aren't they? Oh yeah. 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 Um, Especially out, especially there. I mean, you got a town there that was just inundated with a lot of tragedy. Everything's imprinted, and yeah, it's everywhere. But you know, honestly, even in the town I live in now, it's an area I grew up when I was a kid. You know, hauntings are pretty pervasive. So, yeah. What makes a haunting? you know, like you to use your word as we get about 40 seconds here, pervasive and uncomfortable. Well, it's, especially if it's an earthbound, uh, it doesn't know why it's there. The energy doesn't know why it's there. It's not residual. Uh, and it tries to get the attention of whoever's there. And, uh, in the process of getting the attention, it, it, it makes noises and does things where it scares the individual. And that's basically a haunting. It's uh, that's usually what happens in those cases. Well, Lon, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Strange days with Lon Strickler from PhantomsAndMonsters.com is continuing here tonight. Lon is, of course, an author of nine books. They can all be found on Amazon. We highly suggest that you check them on out and add them to your library. And, of course, more monster stories along with your questions when we return with Lon Strickler for hour number two of Spaced Out Radio next.
I'm just going to step out and uh, take my dog outside. He's getting a little rambunctious here, so that okay. usually means that it's that time. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that, boss. All right. Dog took longer than I thought. <laughs> All right. Hi, Joey. Matthew Anderson. Thanks for coming on in. Sensational Sherry. Thanks for joining us. And who else is new that's popped on in here in the last few seconds? 
Uh, the gorgeous Stephanie Jackson just got home from the gym. Yeah, I'm tired just that you worked out. I'm beat now. Oh, I, that was a good workout. Good, solid workout. All right. Thank you, Michael Gutierrez, for an awesome super chat, along with Ed and Tim. Thank you so much. The super chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're having a good time tonight with Lon Strickler. Hey, don't forget, everybody. <clears throat> Lynn Wallington is expanding her little franchise. Yeah, she's going to continue on with Spaced Out Weekends. And she also has her brand new channel called Rebellious Ufology. I highly suggest that you go, go on over and click subscribe on that. I will uh, grab the link here for you. Because we all love Lynn. And she needs our love over there, too. And uh, <clears throat> let me grab it here for you. Here's her link. It's in the chat room right now. Greatly appreciate if you all subscribe to that. And I'll put up the link to Canada's Great Unknown as well. If you wouldn't mind hitting up my new channel, I would appreciate it. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's do this thing. It's our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to go and join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, and the password is Ukraine. Ukraine is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Strange Days with... Lon Strickler, yes, he is taking over the Monday slot, as we love to have Lon around here and filling in for the big shoes left by the departed Butch Witkowski. Lon's website is phantomsandmonsters.com. He is one of the best when it comes to taking reports of all things strange. Lon, welcome back. Hey, Dave. Great to be here. We should also mention Lon has nine books out, nine of them. You can get them all on Amazon. They're great to add for your own personal cryptid collection as well. And so, Lon, you know what? We, we're going through a bunch of these stories, man, that, that you have on phantomsandmonsters.com. Mm -hmm. And some of them are absolutely incredible. And I know that uh, you're not, you know, you take these reports and, and you kind of let people understand and, and figure them out for yourselves. But this one really, really... Uh, got to be recently, man, because we have heard so much about this, uh, whether or not there are giants in the Kandahar province of Afghanistan. You actually got a report on one. Yeah, that um, actually that <laughs> that story has been going around for a long time. Uh, it was in the Kandahar province where... Um, I, I, I don't know exactly why the this uh, why this patrol was out there, uh, but they swear that they encountered this huge red-haired <laughs> giant um, that literally killed one of the combat uh, one of the soldiers with a with a spear. Um, the the image that I have on on the uh, on the website on the blog 
was from a piece of art of the incident. I've seen several renditions of it, but apparently when this occurred, uh, after he had killed the soldier, they, the rest of the patrol took him down, shot him, killed him. And they called in a helicopter that dropped a huge pallet down. They put this thing on the pallet, lifted it up and took it off took off i you know i haven't really heard anything else beyond that what i will tell you is that um i've had a lot of strange reports come out of afghanistan over the years uh that kandahar province in particular other, some of the north um north eastern provinces there were up in the mountains there have been a few things that people have seen even upright canines uh so yeah you know been some pretty you, strange stories out of there. Did you ever hear Jody Cook from the North American Dog Band Project's report on the uh, these Anubis type of dogmen that were all with armor and and with these these scythe like swords? I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. That report came in from a gentleman who was listening to this show with Jody on it, and then uh, it followed up with another report from someone else who was confirming the original report. And it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of times when we get these reports of canine creatures, it a lot of them have to do with the Anubis, type, looking like the Anubis uh, deity, uh, the jackal deity from Egypt, you know, Egyptian lore. Uh, I don't know why that is. Is it, uh, is it a relic? Is it, you know, something dimensional? I don't know, but you know, that, that reference does come up at times. Wow. Why do you think there's giants still in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan? I don't know. You know, you, you know, I'm not really into the giant lore. I mean, there've been a lot of claims over, over time, even here in, in, in the United States. Uh, it, it's interesting when you get a bunch of soldiers mention something about it and uh, swear they took this thing out and that it actually killed one of their comrades. Uh, that makes it a little more believable. Um, you know, I don't know how to take a lot of these giant um, incidents as being fact, uh, many times there, there, there seem to be contrived, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, if I ever see evidence to where I believe it's true, yeah, I'll look into it. But, uh, you know, to this point, I really haven't seen a whole lot. All right. Let's move on to some questions here as they're starting to compile here for us. <laughs> let's start off with Nicola here. Lon, since you do a lot of paranormal ghosts and evil things, have you ever had an attachment? Mm -hmm. I actually had an attachment removed not long ago. Um, it was something that was attached to me back in the 80s from a case I did. Uh, it was a female entity. I didn't know anything about it. And one of my team uh, saw it on me. She's psychic and uh very intuitive and uh i i carried this thing for almost 35 years and she removed it and it was almost I, I tell you after it after she removed it it was just like i i deflated i was gone for 24 hours i couldn't even move i sat in my chair for 24 hours couldn't do anything so she definitely did something she definitely removed something but yeah she's she, you know, she explained it to me and what it was. And yeah, it's something that I encountered many, many years ago that I didn't even know I picked anything up from it. It was a case I was involved in. How do you know if you have something attached to you? A lot of times you don't. Um, you know, I have, uh, I have been involved with hauntings and uh, infestations where um, 
you know, you just think that's what you're going into. You're going into something that's hanging around a home or a location. And it turns out the, the person itself has actually got an attachment or not a possession, but something that's, um, uh, uh, you know, oppression or something, but it's usually an attachment of, of a of a uh, spirit energy. It's not always malevolent. In fact, very rarely it's malevolent. It's just something that has found you as a host. It's earthbound and it's um, it has found its way to you. And uh, if it's not bothering you, or you don't think it's bothering you. Uh, it's kind of hard to to know that it's there unless somebody picks up on it and or it starts causing issues and then they may find out that's what it is. All right, let's go to Seven Raven Wolf. Lon, have you any knowledge of Crystal Cities under Mount Shasta or other places? You hear a lot about that. Uh, you hear about the Lemurian uh, <laughs> uh, Crystal Cities and this and that. I don't know how to really take that. I uh, I know a few people who swear by it. Uh, I know a few other people who who believe that there's a population of huge Bigfoot that live on Sh Mount Shasta. Uh, but there there are a lot of uh, esoteric tales about the location. Uh, but yeah, that Crystal City is one of them. I don't necessarily know where or why that is um, is part of the lore of the mountain, but I do know people that swear it's there. All right, let's go to Fairy Finder. Lon, have you ever murdered a monster? Uh, I I'm happy to say I didn't. Have you ever gotten physical contact with one? No. All right, let's go to the Michael Leger, who is the creator of the gnome on my desk. <laughs> and he is asking, Lon, what's your scariest encounter of all time? Uh, probably the winged humanoid encounter. Yeah, that's probably. That was least understood at the time. It was kind of unexpected. We weren't really looking for it. And uh, I know it scared the living crap out of my friend. Uh, I was probably more shocked than scared, but, um, I really, you know, after that happened, I got curious. I wanted to know what we were dealing with, but, uh, like I said, it's very similar to what people have been seeing in, uh, in Chicago. That just still trips me out. <laughs> still trips me out. I'm, I'm curious, uh, in regards to the moth band, we might as well get, a quick update here. I mean, for a while there, these stories seem to come and go in ebb and flow. Yeah. Has there been a lot of uh, action with the uh, sightings around uh, the Mothman in Chicago recently? It's been pretty sparse, but we've had um, we've had most of the sightings continue out at O'Hare. Uh, it's um, it, it's not as heavy as it has been, but. I don't know what the reason is behind it is because of the weather and, and, and less people are noticing it. Uh, I, I do know that uh, the last real sighting we had out there was an incident where these three cargo workers saw this thing and actually started videotaping it, well, digitally recording it on their phones. And uh, their supervisors in TSA made them made them uh, erase all of it. It's too bad they didn't get it uploaded on the cloud, but um, these guys were really scared. They they thought they were going to lose their jobs. But one later on, one of them did come forward and, and tell us what happened. But um, those three beings, from what, you, from what I understand in, in the description we got, may very well have been something much different than what we've been dealing with in the past out of O'Hara. So, uh, I don't know. All right. I'm going to go jump uh, Stephen's question here because Duke from World Bigfoot Radio kind of has a, a follow-up to this. He goes, what do you think of the theory that the Chicago Mothman is actually a Sandhill Crane? You know, I, it, it's very possible that 
a, a sighting or two may have been a sandhill crane, a misidentification, could even have been a blue heron. But just based on the size, the characteristics, the way it flies, uh, I, I, I'm more than positive that this was, these were not misidentifications for the most part. We've had, we've had over 140 sightings that we believe were, um, that we were legitimate. And if we, if we have any inkling that it's an unidentified bird or something, we're not even going to report that, uh, we're getting way too many reports, too many encounters, close encounters with these things that there, there's no way they're birds. Have you ever seen a sandhill crane? Yes, I have. They're massive. Yeah, they are big. I didn't even know they existed. And one day we were up here checking out, we have this beautiful lake called Valentine Lake. It's got that, that crystal greenish blue water. Mm -hmm. And we, we, came out of the campsite and we started going down the logging road because we were doing a little bit of investigation for Sasquatch and we turned up this this road beside the lake and there were two of them standing there and and I was looking at them and I'm like what the hell are these things like I couldn't believe a six foot bird standing there mm -hmm. and then when the wingspan is is close to condor size I mean when these things took off I mean it, they look like a C5 galaxy. It took them forever to get up into altitude. Yeah, they're big. And they also have a, a red ring around their eyes, too. Uh, the fact that their necks are so long and accounts for most of their height, I and many times these wing structures that were reported are like membrane wings, like they were bad or so. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's what people are seeing. But, you know, I, I will admit that maybe some of the sightings that we decided not to look into may have been Sandhill Crane or Blue Heron. Right. All right. Let's move on to Steven's question. Have you ever been pushed by a ghost? Yeah. I've had a few tussles with, with them. What's uh, that like? Well, it's usually out of the blue and usually it's from behind, but, um, I've had I've had them try to push me down a stair or two or uh, try to trip me up or something, but no, and you know, and I've I've witnessed people literally push the ground by these things. Uh, if it's malevolent enough and it's trying, or even if it's trying to get your attention and and doesn't know its own strength, it'll it'll do that. But um, I I, I have had a, I have had a few encounters, and in fact, I you know when I do a remote view when I've done cases especially overseas, I've done cases. Um, I have literally had psychic attacks at long distance. So, uh, I mean, there have been times I had a laceration. I was doing a case and received a laceration from my sternum down to my belly button one time. And another psychic attack resulted in bruised ribs in which I had to go to the hospital. Wow. Yeah. How do you explain that to the doctor? You what don't. Happened? I was attacked by a ghost. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> that case, no. I didn't say a thing. I just said I fell. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. No kidding whatsoever. All right, let's get to Gloria's question here. She would like to ask you, Lon, as we got about five and a half minutes left before the break at the bottom of the hour, who or what do you think Indrid Cold is or was? That's an interesting story. Uh, the Derenberger, Woody Derenberger story. Um, you know, his daughter swears that it, it happened. This, this, uh, this being or man by the name of Indrid Cold was, came from another planet, had friends that accompanied him here, had a family that lived here with him. Uh, his father, her father had the encounter uh, up in West Virginia of this being called Indrid Cold, the grinning man that came out of a, a saucer-like craft that landed in front of him. Uh, I've had people in later years describe getting text messages and telephone calls from some people calling themselves Indrid Cold, though I don't know if it's true or not. I had one of these encounters happen 
in association with a uh, um, a winged humanoid sighting up in Hartwick, New York. Uh, my an associate of mine actually went up there and investigated that, and uh, there's a lot of strange things that went up that house. But she swears she had two encounters with this winged humanoid and received a text and then a phone call uh, when her 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 caller ID came up entered cold. And when she answered the phone, the guy on the other side of the, of the, you know, other side of the call. And this was like 10 minutes after her encounter told her, do not tell anybody about your encounter. How do you explain that? I, I don't know. I mean, I have talked to uh, Dr. Raymond Keller, who's a friend of mine. He's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's probably the most interesting ufologist I know of. And uh, he's very, very into the subject. He believes injured cold is real and actually still exists. So who knows what's going on with that? For people who may not be familiar with Indrid cold, how would you describe this entity, ghost, alien, demonic? How would you describe it? Alien, extraterrestrial, ultra terrestrial, anything. It could be all the above. I mean, um, I, I, I believe it, there's a possibility of some type of being who's calling himself injured cold. Could it be a non-human? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just don't know. I mean, do you think he's still around? Do you think well, he's still here? I personally, I don't know. I've had people tell me they believe he's here. Uh, people who have been in, involved with ufology since the uh since the 60s and before um who believe the, the whole story and the actual encounter and the subsequent encounters and um that this being may still be around maybe still living among us uh some people believe it's a government agent some believe it's an extraterrestrial i don't know what the what to think it is you know I have no idea. Um, you know, the interesting thing is it happened around the same time of the, uh, the Mothman sightings down at Point Pleasant in the late 60s. And uh, many people do associate it with those sightings, though I really don't. I don't, I don't know if it's, it's related or not. Though Ray, Ray does think it's related to the Mothman sightings, so who knows. Well, I know that during the Hel Hellier expedition... <laughs> They believed that it was getting into Indrid Cold territory as well. And I know Alan Greenfield, who's going to be a guest on this show, Secret Cypher UFO Knots, uh, is also, um, you know, believing that that um, Indrid Cold exists as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it very well could be. I, I, you know, I really don't know. Uh, all I can do is, you know, report what's been told to me and um, uh, and what I've read and what I've found in research over the years. I, I really don't know what this being is. Well, I have one other question for you is we got about a minute left here. Mm -hmm. With Indrid Cold, a lot of people state that if you say his name too much, that it's almost like summoning him and, you know, all of a sudden his energy or his his spirit or whatever will show up where you are. Have you ever bought into that fairy tale? Not necessarily. You know, I've, I've talked about him a lot myself and I've never had anything happen to me. So, or see anything. So I don't know, maybe, maybe some people it has, but I don't know. Well, it was worth the shot. Okay. <laughs> it was worth the shot. I, I had to ask Lon, I'm going to get you to hold on right there okay. because there's only about 15 seconds left, and there's really no point in asking another question, but I do know we have more audience questions to go with you tonight. Lon Strickler's Strange Days. Lon joins us from phantomsandmonsters.com, and I highly suggest you go over to his YouTube channel and hit subscribe there. It is a community thing. We love Phantoms and Monsters around here, and we love all of our supporters on YouTube and around the world on uh, to go onto YouTube and hit that subscribe button on Phantoms and Monsters podcast that Lon hosts. You can find nine of his books 
on Amazon.com. Von Strickler's Strange Days has the final half hour coming up right after this. That half hour flew by. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Hi, Kason. How you doing in Sri Lanka tonight? All right. Brian, I'll get to your question in a little bit. And uh, Steve, your question's up next. A few minutes to go, Lon, then you could get off to bed here. <laughs> uh, I got people calling me, and I, I got to make phone calls on the, when I'm done tonight. Maybe somebody's sending me cases. I know that feeling. I know that feeling. You just get done the show, and all of a sudden, it's like now you get a got to get on the phone. I know that feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> For what we do, it never ends. <laughs> Mm, yeah, it is. It, 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 you know, it's funny. Sometimes I'll be sitting here and there's nothing going. I was like, oh, what the hell? And then all of a sudden I get nailed and I don't have enough time. Oh, God. Seems like every time I get involved with writing a book, that's when everybody's calling me. Dude, I fully get it. I fully get it. PBR, play nice. Play nice. Got to erase that comment. Don't make me shake my finger at you, PBR. You've been doing good all night, buddy. River Dogma, I hear you've signed up for the Vegas party. Tell me, is this rumor true? April 22nd and 24th, we are having the SOR fan party in Las Vegas. I think we got about 39 people signed up for that so far. We got a bunch of great guests from this show who are coming on in to hang out with all of you. It's all at the Golden Nugget. And I'll be there on Thursday, and I'm leaving Monday. Mm. So it's going to be a wild one for old Davey, but we are going to have a very, very cool time in Las Vegas. And uh, yet, yeah, good job, River Dog. I'm glad you're going to be there. Obi Fled is going to be there. I know there's a bunch of you guys who are going to be there. We're, we're going to have a great time. We really are. Man, I haven't been out in Vegas in, oh my God, 30 years. My God. It's changed a little bit. Oh, yeah. It always changes. You know, yeah. I haven't been to Vegas in six years. Really? And it's, uh, I, I'm curious to see how much it's changed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, I used to, uh, when I was steel workers, when I was working with the steel workers. I was out there every, every couple of years and uh, for conventions and stuff. And yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree. I used to go down uh, every time Guns N' Roses had a, uh, a residency, I was going down. Hmm. They did that for a while, and damn it, then Axel brought the band back together, well, at least half of them, which I don't mind, but kind of killed the fun. <laughs> mm. Now my, my $100 uh, ticket to get in on the floor is now worth about, I don't know, 1000 bucks. 
Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, it would be interesting. I, you know, I, I do look at some of the hotels that are going up, and uh, yeah, it's completely different than what it was. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I want to say, big, I want to say a big thank you to Stephen, Michael, Ed, and Tim for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you so much. Really helps out what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And uh, don't forget to support Lynn Wallington's Rebellious Ufology and my Canada's Great Unknown on YouTube. We'd greatly appreciate it. Here we go with the next half hour. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you all with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate you tuning us on in. Want to remind you that if you have missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, we introduce Lon Strickler from phantomsandmonsters.com. He's here as a monthly guest for Strange Days as we continue on with the new era of this part of the show, and we're always glad to have Lon here. You can find any of his books on Amazon. He's got nine of them out there that he has written about all strange encounters and sightings. Lon, welcome back. Good to be here, Dave. Let's start off with Steve's question here. Have you seen a possession or an exorcism? I, you know, I have been uh, in the presence of two exorcisms where the... Um, where they, uh, the Catholic rites were used by a priest. Uh, I witnessed that. That was interesting. Uh, it's not like you see on TV, but it, it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, I've had some cases where um, they weren't possessions, but they were pretty close to it. Uh, they were pretty malevolent attachments where we've had to work for several days to to have them removed. Um, I, I've also been involved with cases where a priest would be there and they end up running out the room, running out the door and taking off and because uh, it scared them. So, yeah, I, I, I've been involved in a few cases over the years. What's it like to see that go on? It, you know, um, like I said, it's not like the movies. Um, you, you, when you look at the victim, the person who's possessed, the way they contort and do this and that, it's not necessarily something where it couldn't be, let's say, faked. But I, I believe, um, and look, I'm not a very religious person. Uh, I, I was basically there at request and was able to go there with a few other people and, and witness it. But uh, it's it's interesting. It really is an interesting uh, uh, something. It's interesting to watch. Uh, but I'll be quite honest with you, as far as doing what they do. Uh, you know, if I get it, look, if I get a case where I, I think that that is what's needed to remedy the situation, then I will have someone call someone in from the church. I mean, you know, that's, that's out of my realm, but no, I ha I have seen it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's move on to another question. This one from Brian, you know, all the talk of Indrid cold makes me wonder, Lon, what's your thoughts on Valiant Thor. 
Oh, I think it actually happened. I think this guy showed up. I don't know. I think people knew who he was. Uh, supposedly he was helping the government, was involved in some projects at the Pentagon, was here for a number of years. You know, I have talked to people who swear the guy was here. Um, once again, I talked to Raymond Keller, who looked into the case. He's actually involved with a book uh, now that he's writing a bit about Bang and Thor in that book. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of truth. There may be some truth to it. Uh, was he extraterrestrial? I don't know. Could have been. So you're still not convinced he was from Venus? Well, uh, you know, that's what they say. Uh, you know, Raymond, Raymond Keller, Dr. Raymond Keller, he's the, he's the expert on Venus, but he believes it was, uh, it was a true thing. So, uh, uh, I'm going to go by what he says. All right. Supernor wants to know if you have any knowledge of light beings. Hmm. Now, when you mean, when you say light beings, what does that refer to? Does that refer to, um uh spirits or i i think that's where where super okay. nowhere is going yeah yeah oh yeah i mean and there's a lot of the degrees of what you want to call light beings or spirits or entities energy it's all energy you know um earth bounds residual some go in and out i mean that, there's, there's a lot of degrees to it um but yeah, I have had knowledge of it. I, I, I think I can, well, I can sense spirit energy. I mean, I am intuitive. I, um, my, it's interesting when I, uh, when I come across spirit energy, I start seeing colors, which is, it's bizarre. I, I know, but I, uh, I start seeing certain colors that I recognize as spirit energy within my midst. And, uh, yeah, that's when I can usually tell there's something around me. Really? Mm hmm Do you get the chills that's spine tingling or you just feel the energy? I just, I just see the colors and I start feeling the energy. And the colors are pink, like, like a, a pink and, uh, like a sea foam green. Those are the two colors that. I associate with spirit energy. It's in my mind's eye, but I, I sense it. It's hard to explain, but that's, that's how I sense it. Well, you know what, for me, I always, when I'm around something and I, if I feel a ghost around, I feel it very heavy on my shoulders. Yeah. Like it's draining. It's heavy. I feel like I'm being pushed to slouch over. Do you get that as well? I don't get that, but I, I know people that do. Uh, some people have a, a, a variety of physical uh, indicators that something's around them. Uh, sometimes it's like a heaviness on their hands, on their shoulders, sometimes down their back, like something's hanging on to them. Uh some people, I know one person whose legs go totally numb when it happens. It's it's weird, but it, it's different for different people. How do you cleanse yourself from that energy? Because it is, you know, it can weigh a lot on you. If you all of a sudden you get into the channeling or you get into the communication aspect mm -hmm. and, and the darker the spirit, the, the heavier it gets. You just got to learn to protect yourself. Um, there, there's several ways of doing it. I use a golden or white light that surrounds me and extends out past my auras. Uh, it's a visualized energy field that I use. Uh, there are some um, in, uh, incantations, you want to call them incantations or such that I use as well. Um, but I'm usually prepared. I, there have been times early on when I wasn't prepared and I paid for it. Uh, when you get a physical or a psychic attack from something, uh, that has happened on occasion. And see that, you know, it's interesting. 
many times when I have been involved with clearing spirit energy, uh, oppressions or uh, attachments, it's usually for someone who decided to go ghost hunting and didn't protect themselves. You know, you get a lot of these people that go running out into the graveyard and start invoking spirits and they get more than what they bargained for. And when they come home, some, they, they notice strange things going on. And that's when I get called. And I, I've had that happen countless times. Oh, very sure. Hmm. Very sure. You know, I mean, out of all the ghostly encounters that you've had, mm -hmm. do you look at at the spirit encounters as you're dealing with dead people or people on a different dimension? Uh, life force, uh, the, the the remainder of the dead uh, that is energy, and uh, if it's earthbound, that's when they stay with on our earth plane. Uh, they, many times there's a lot of different reasons. Many times they don't even know they're dead. They're stuck here for some reason or another. They can't move on or it's impossible. They don't want to move on. Sometimes they do not want to move on. Uh, it's all free will. Uh, sometimes you got to coax them into doing it, but you can't push them. You can't force them to leave. And, um, there have been times when I have been involved with uh, a clearing to where I literally, and look, you know, may, people are going to, some people may think I'm full of it, but I, I am a very, I'm very big believer angels. And, uh, I have used angels to clear. And, um, that's normally what is invoked by me to help move these, these energies into the next level. Now, where they take them, I don't exactly know. I've got theories, but yeah, that's that's what I sense when I'm doing a clearing. And like I told you earlier, I mean, it is when you do that and when you help someone like that, that's probably the, the best feeling you're ever going to get. What's your opinion on Ouija boards? Oh, I stay away from them like the plague. I had a uh, I had an encounter on one of those things when I was in high school and uh, they're bad. I mean, and for the most part, the reason they're bad is people use these things and don't clear them and whatever is there, whatever shows up a lot of time attaches to the board. I had, um, I'll tell you the story if you, if you want me to, but um, I was in high school. I was at a party at a friend's house. And they had the Ouija board out. I'm sitting on the sofa. And uh, there's a bunch of people in front of me on the coffee table playing with this Ouija board. And there was one guy across from me who I was watching. And this guy was looking at me like, I mean, he was watching me and giving me the evil eye. I mean, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I kept watching. Now, I wasn't using the board. But all of a sudden, this guy jumped over the table and attacked me. And, and when they started pulling him off of me, that he calmed down and said he didn't know what happened to him. So, okay, well, you know, he apologized and everything. But as we were sitting there, you know, just talking, not using the board, we started noticing the planchette on this board starting rising into the air. No. Yeah, and a bunch of high school kids were in this club basement – we all run to the other side of the room by Ooh. the bar. It must have been about 15 of us. And this planchette was hovering above the board about three foot. And we're just watching this thing. Everybody's freaking out. And all of a sudden, this thing slams down onto the board and the legs blow out of it. And you've never seen so many people haul up the stairs as fast as those kids did. Uh, I was one of them. I, I, that's the first time I ever witnessed anything like that. So, uh, I swore up and down that I wouldn't be fooling with a Ouija board. You know, it's funny. My dad owned a hobby shop. We had a, we had a family business and our family business was hobby shops and 
electric trains and stuff, you know. And my dad used to sell those things in the store, the Ouija boards. I, you know, I just said, hell, I, I don't really have anything to do with these things anymore. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite Ouija board stories, we weren't using a Ouija board. We were using a spirit board. Mm -hmm. And on this night, uh, my buddy had a, a two bedroom cabin, log cabin style home on 10 acres. That's where a lot of my experiences happen. And we were sitting around using this spirit board. And all of a sudden he looked over to his wood stove and it's burning. Like there's flames mm -hmm. in the wood stove. So he says to the kids and to us adults, did, did anybody start this? And we were all like, no. And he goes to the kids, did you start it? And, and they're like, no, you don't allow us to touch the fireplace. And I'm like, okay. So he's all of a sudden the planchette, we still have our fingers on the planchette. Mm -hmm. Planchette starts moving as he's doing this or talking about this. And his fingers aren't even on the, on the board. Right. And so here I am. And his, his fiance at the time looks down at the board and says, did you start the fire in the fireplace? It goes to yes. Mm. Right. And we asked why, and it spelled out, I was cold. <laughs> that fireplace, it was 1030 at night. That fireplace hadn't been lit since 930 that morning. Mm -hmm. Wow. And here we were. Here we were. Yeah, some of the Ouija and spirit board stories are pretty bizarre. But there's a lot of them. There's some about those boards. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, they just, they're weird. Would I use one again? Yes. I don't see a difference between them or pendulums or my magic eight ball that I have right here. I don't really <laughs> see. And trust me, the last couple of weeks at Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio, he can attest to this. We've actually had to uh, smudge this recently because it was giving real negative answers. Oh, yeah. Real negative answers. And we actually smudged it a couple mm -hmm. times to get it going and get the engine back started. You know, but I mean, hey, you got to do what you got to do. You, you know, I don't, rec I don't recommend any type of divination unless you know what the hell you're doing and what the consequences are. Uh, you know, but yeah, there's just something about Ouija boards. I had enough that one time and I've heard way too many stories involving them that, you know, that's just not for me. <clears throat> no, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it at all. My friend, I don't get it at all. I try, but you know, it, it's just, it is what it is. Hmm. I would be remiss. In not having a strange days without talking, as we got about six minutes left with you about some dogman bipedal canines. Any new cases around those? Yeah, we're involved with one right now. Um, we got a we got a call from the, uh, a family in uh, outside of Akron, Ohio, that have been dealing with us for the past decade or longer, about twelve years. In fact, it was a case that was written by um, uh, Linda Godfrey in one of her books years ago. American Werewolf, I think it was the book was. And anyway, uh, the sightings have continued on since then, and, and really nobody has helped this family at all. So, and, and there were there were some sightings nearby there years ago. So, uh, yeah, uh, we've been, we've been talking with this witness for the past two weeks, but it's interesting, uh, when my team started getting involved with this case, we, uh, they sensed, and I have a couple of psychics who are on my team, uh, and the witness didn't tell us that they were having spirit activity in the house, pretty, pretty serious spirit activity. And uh, this one individual on my team, she picked it up, picked up on it. So we're going to take care of that first. Incrementally, we're going to get that taken care of. 
before we start working with the upright canines. But yeah, there, there's this stuff's going on. And from what we're being told, these things are not not good not good beings. Uh, really? There, there's some evil involved with it here from what we understand. And um uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, uh and I I'll I'll keep keeping up on it. I'm putting updates. I did I did put the initial uh, story up on on the blog, but I will be putting updates as we go along. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, just like any case, it, it, extreme confidentiality, no actual locations. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can get this resolved for them. But it's going to take some work. No, it, it is going to take some work, I, and I could just imagine how tough that is. I mean, when you have that much evil or demonic entities coming at one person. I mean, how do you even protect them? Well, you know, like with any case where you've got um, malevolent energies in, in location, you've got to, first of all, find out what they've been doing over the years that has been exasperating the, the, uh, the activity. And apparently this witness, I mean, this client of ours, has somehow locked in this being into this home. Uh, the being has, uh, is a previous owner. And uh, I believe this, this previous owner had encounters with these, these upright canines as well, and that they were aware of it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looking into a little bit different here. Uh, like with a lot of cases, we, we go into a lot of different aspects where there are um, <clears throat> different aspects of the paranormal involved here we got spirit activity and uh an cryptid and i have been involved with cases where cryptids have been attracted to spirit activity you know you hear you have heard of um uh, bigfoot and upright canines or dogmen being attracted to cemeteries and areas right. like that and uh yeah I, I think that's why they're hanging around there because the activity of the uh, woman who used to live there is, is pretty active and pretty strong. So, uh, you know, that may be the root of the problem, but we're going to try and figure it out. In regards to Sasquatch dog man hanging out at cemeteries, uh -huh. do you think that, that they are almost protecting the spirits? Could be. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I think they're attracted to it for some reason. Is it anything to do with protection? I really don't know. Um, but they they do seem to be attracted to these areas. Uh, is it because people show up and they're fascinated by the people being at the location? I, I don't know if I, I don't know if that's it or not. But I have had several incidents reported me at cemeteries where people have seen these things along the edges. My goodness. Yeah. My friend, we have 90 seconds left. That's it. In your first strange days. You know, very impressive. Very impressive tonight, Lon Strickler. Thank you so much for being here with our audience. Well, I'm glad to do it. And, uh, of course, we all miss Butch. Uh, you know, Butch and I were like, <laughs> like uh, together. Well, we were together for many years, and we did a lot of cases together. And, uh I will miss him, but you know I'm more than happy to, to take the uh, take the reins on this, and uh, I appreciate you asking me. Do me a favor, one minute to go. Tell everybody where they can find Phantoms and Monsters on YouTube website and your books. Yeah, you just go to uh, phantomsandmonsters.com. That's the blog. We do a daily update on cases and uh, sightings and reports. Uh, the radio show is. Phantoms and Monsters Radio. Uh, just put Phantoms and Monsters into the search. It'll come right up. Uh, it used to be Arcane Radio, but we've rebranded and uh, we're doing some improvements there. And uh, my team is Phantoms and Monsters 14 Research, and we look into all kinds of cases involving the paranormal. And uh, we, you know, we're keeping busy, but look, you, you guys have reports and such. Just contact me at Lon Strickler, phantomsandmonsters.com. Well, Lon, we're very glad to have you part of the Spaced Out Radio family now. And anything we can do to help you guys out, 
at phantomsandmonsters.com. Let us know. And we appreciate you, Lon Strickler, of course. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, we're going to enter the swamp with another great story from Swamp Dweller. And then the fedora-wearing John Hudson will join us for the unbiased UFO report. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio after this. Great job, Lon. Okay, Great Dave. Job. <clears throat> you you are fantastic. And we'll do this again in a month from now. Okay. Keep in touch. Uh, I will. I, I do have to talk to you about next month. I'm not sure if we'll actually have a show. Okay. I am flying home from San Francisco and UFO Con, and it all depends how quickly I get out of the airport in order to uh, make it home for showtime. But I'll let you know, okay? Okay. No, no problem. All right, buddy. Take it easy. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Let us wait for the fedora-wearing John Hudson. <clears throat> Cecil, how you doing? Or is it Cecil? Are you a Cecil or a Cecil? All right. Let's bring it on down. There's no attacking Thomas Fessler in our chat room, please, and thank you very much. And you know what? I'm a good friend of Thomas's. He's a good friend of mine. And I will not put up with any type of attacks on people in our chat room. All right? You don't have to like him for what's going on, uh, but there are two sides to every story. And Thomas has his story. I have my story. And you guys have heard from the other people on their stories. All right. I, I don't like talking about this stuff, but there is no attacking people in my chat room at all. At all. All right. Those other shows have friends who listen here, and we have friends here who listen to other shows. Just remember, there's always different sides to the story. And... uh you might want to check the research on it. That's all I'll say. I'll be right back. I'm going to get some water. <clears throat> or another glass of iced tea, one of the two.
Dave's coming back. Dave's coming back. All right. I'm back. Yeah, you, you can still insult Justin Trudeau, of course. Bombshell bomber, of course. That's allowed. <clears throat> so, it's okay. That's okay. We're all good. Kason, did you have a good chat with my chair? Just curious. Body Tech, good morning to you. Huh. There's the fedora. Look at him. And he's got light on him, too. Yeah, a little bit more like that, buddy. <clears throat> How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm good. Throat's a little ratchety, but that's okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Got about 30 seconds here, John. Cool. Did you find that story I was telling you about? Yeah, no, actually, I almost was late because I, I got sucked into that interview that, that came in. It was actually really good. I was really enjoying yeah, it. That's yeah. what I realized. Yeah. All right. Hold on a second here. We're going to go in 10 seconds. Uh, John, I'm going to mute you. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go at the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Kabotched. Kabotched is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well, follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. It is that time of the night once again where we head into the swamp, get deep, dark, and dastardly with the man they call the Swamp Dweller. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. So my name is Colton. And I'm a regular guy from a regular small town, and I'm a family man. The year is March of 2020. The entire nation was going through a very unusual, odd, and what could be characterized as downright scary time. I doubt that I need to go into what I'm talking about. I would just say that the word lockdown is no longer a term used just for prisons, even though that's kind of what it felt like at times. My story starts maybe 10 days into the initial lockdown. Let me start by saying that I live in a very conservative state. We have very few restrictions on firearms or your ability to use them. Our state has what is commonly referred to as the Castle Doctrine, which in a nutshell means if you are on my property and I deem you as a threat, I am within my rights to use deadly force to protect myself, my family, or my property. I will also mention that we have one of the lowest violent crime percentages in the nation, which is why I choose to raise my family here. 
The reason that I note that before anything else is to impress you on the feeling of safety I have felt here my entire life. Not being safe in my home, or even my own town, has never crossed my mind. That is, until about three weeks ago. So it was a Friday night. I would say that it was any normal Friday night. But that was not the case. After 9pm there is nothing, and I mean nothing. Not a car, not a bike, not a person. Heck, no noise at all. It's like The Walking Dead minus the zombies. This night we had broken out the board games and Clue was the decided upon game. About 25 minutes into the game, my 16-year-old son bumps my shoulder and asked, Hey Pop, did you hear that? I replied, Hear what, son? He said that he heard something like a tapping sound. But between me, him, and his two sisters and mom, there was quite a bit of talking and laughing going on. Our house is two stories. The family area is in the basement level, which is where we were. Upstairs is the front door and the entry of three bedrooms. Maybe five minutes later, I hear the same sound that my son was talking about. He says, See, Dad, look, there it is again. I told him that this time I heard it, too, and that I would go up and have a look. I went up the stairs and started towards the front door when I heard a very loud knock. It was like a pounding more than anything. It was coming from the front door, so I decided to go check it out. I stopped in my tracks for a few seconds as I noticed the upstairs lights are off and it is quite dark even though I know I left them on before I went downstairs. I decided to peek through my blinds to see who was there. My front porch light was tripped, so I knew something had to be there, but I could see absolutely nothing. I do have a security system that has a front door camera, so I retreated downstairs and grabbed my tablet to have a look at what triggered my light and pounded my door. I went back 10 minutes to about the time my son heard the first noise, fully expecting to see some kids messing around. The light came on and the camera recorded the tapping sound, but there was absolutely nothing visually there. The light goes off after 60 seconds of no movement. A few minutes later, the light again comes on and the system again recorded the tapping, but still, there was nothing there. Three minutes later, the system is once again activated, and this time the pounding is happening again and again. But there is again nothing visually there to clue me in as to what is happening. I thought maybe there was an issue with the video, so I activated all six cameras and ran a diagnostic. Everything was seemingly running perfect. My son asked me if he could try something. I said sure and handed the tablet over. He reminded me that these cameras do have a night vision capability. He rewound the video and then he put on the night vision setting. Two seconds before the light came on, the camera caught a disturbing image. It was a shape that was kind of transparent and moved without touching the ground as if it was floating. It moved very quickly and very suddenly. It covered my 50 foot front walkway in about two seconds. My son asked me, Seriously, Dad, what is that? I told him I had no idea and took the tablet from him and started forwarding it to see the second tapping noise. Now once the light comes on, the night vision feature no longer works, but the light goes off, the feature works again automatically. As I'm forwarding the video, the light goes off, and to my amazement, the thing is still there at the door. It is standing still. Then after three minutes or so, the light trips on and you hear the tapping once again, but nothing appears on the camera. After 60 seconds pass, the light goes off and sure enough, whatever it is is still there. Again, it is still as a statue. Another four minutes go by and the light comes on and the pounding is heard once more. I waited the 60 seconds and when the light goes off, the thing is not there anymore. I then activate all six cameras on the live feed and pin on the night vision setting. I almost drop the tab. There in the backyard looking through a window is that thing. By this time, my whole family are looking at the screen when all of us realized that the window this thing was looking through was right in front of us. The girls were agitated and scared, and I'm going to be honest, I was a bit worried too. I've never experienced or seen anything like this outside of a horror movie. I gave the tablet to my son and told him to keep an eye on it and let me know if that thing moves. I went to the closet, grabbed my Benelli 12-gauge shotgun, and headed to the back door with my son close behind. I asked, Is it still there, son? He replied, yeah. I told him to disengage the auto feature on the security light so that when I opened the door, the lights wouldn't come on. I quickly opened the door, stepped outside, and looked out the left of my window. My son said, Dad, it's looking at you. 
I yelled. Who are you and what do you want? It's moving toward us, Dad. Now I'm not crazy. When I realized I couldn't see this thing with my own eyes, I'm not going to fire my weapon indiscriminately with no visible target. I stepped back inside and closed and locked the door. It's at the door, he said. My wife is now down the hall asking what in the hell is going on. All I could say is that I had no clue. Then once again, there was tapping on the door. At this point, all I could do was muster a very weak and probably not very intimidating, you are trespassing, leave now. Then the automatic security lights come on, all of them. I whispered to my son, I thought you turned those off. He replied that he did and that the setting was still off, yet all of them stayed on for quite a few minutes. When the lights finally turned off, the thing was no longer at the door. None of the cameras could see it, and it was apparently gone. All five of us stayed up all night watching the cameras. Once the sun came up and my girls went to sleep on the couch, the rest of us couldn't manage to do the same. We just sat there, talking and wondering, re-watching that same 25 minutes of video feed over and over. Another freaky story by the Swamp Dweller, and we love him around here. You can, of course, find more of his work on YouTube at Swamp Dweller Reads. So youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads. Great stories once again. But now it's time to get into the UFO world as we put on our fedora and bring in the fedora-wearing John Hudson for the unbiased UFO report. Mr. John Hudson, good to have you here with us. How you been doing? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good, Dave. Glad to, glad to be here. Thanks for, for hanging out. Do appreciate it. You know, it's late for some of you, so it's nice for you all to hang out and listen in. Absolutely. Uh, you're having a little bit of a microphone issue there. Let's see here. Uh, Let's see. Oh, hold up. Hold up. I, I got it. Hold up. I you got it? Uh, he's figuring it out. We'll this thing, there we go. This thing okay. is literally held together by duct tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, is that better? Product. Much better. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, all right. Time. All right. It's always good to have you here, John. Your knowledge is always very much appreciated on this show. So thank you so much for joining us once again. And and uh, another great uh, piece from you this past weekend, working with Gemma Jade, Thin Lizzy, and Big Willie on the After Hours show. So much fun. So much fun. Oh, yeah. Really, really Sounds enjoying like that. Yeah. No, no, no. Like it's, yeah, no, no. It, they're, they're just, they're... Um, you know, it's um, uh, it's it's just nice when you get to work with nice people. You know, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's it's been you know, it to me, um, this is actually a it's a very interesting and also very challenging time to be invested in this topic because um, I don't know how many of you have heard, but there is this thing going on of somewhere else on the planet that's bad and it's ugly and it's taking up almost every single mainstream news data feed full stop it's astounding um and so it, it's hard to go right but there are some very very interesting things going on like for example um well, our before, friend oh please please, please go ahead before please. Get into that you know I, I don't mind i don't mind spending a couple of minutes on that look we don't talk a lot of politics on this show but i mean it is difficult when the entire world right now john is wondering what is going to go on. Are we going to be ending up in some sort of nuclear confrontation? We don't know really what's going on. The media is playing, you know, propaganda on both sides. It is uh, it is a very nasty time to be on the internet or on television these days. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Absolutely. There, there is also. Um, a magnificent opportunity to um, really revel in the amazing nature of the human being. I mean, the stories that are coming out, I mean, you, you know, okay, sure, throw out half of them. If you're, you know, sure, tr throw out two thirds of them if you're that paranoid, right? But, you know, even if one third of them you, you look at, I mean, these are some incredible stories of strength and some incredible stories of, of courage, some incredible stories of, of standing up for what you believe in. And, and whether you're wrong or not, if you believe it, more power to you, you know. And uh, and so, you know, to me, I just 
um, I, to me, the way I'm seeing different countries come together, the way I'm seeing different uh, groups come together, I'm seeing you know some real um, um, you know a unity in, in certain in certain areas, and um, you know I don't know. I, I like I said, I I really kind of see it as a, as an opportunity to really kind of revel in in some really phenomenal humans doing some really phenomenal things. Well, you know what? Let's just, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's just hope that uh, cooler minds prevail very, very soon. And we can finally, you know, kind of get back to where we were and just hating each other. It's a little bit more easy than watching the world potentially going to blow up. Yeah, if anyone's feeling particularly melancholy, may I, I recommend your favorite drink and um, that song by Sting about uh, the Russians loving their children too. Uh, it'll give you something to think about. I hear you, my friend. I hear you. All right, what do you got for us tonight? So, who is our favorite, 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 favorite UFO person in the whole universe? It's I'm going to say... Anjali must be back in, in the news. You know, and, um, you know, let me just, I you know, I always try to say this before I say anything about her. Um, she's a very unique cat. She, um, she's she got a good spine and she will, she will talk to you. She will listen to you. She will be polite. She will be uh, disagreeable, but she will be very kind about it. And she's being, she's handling a lot of this very well. And so I, I think that's something that always has to be stated because, um, you know, even in this interview that I'm about to talk about, they spent some time talking about this very topic about her demeanor and, and how different it is and how important it is to the dialogue and what we're, what we're all going through. Um, but basically, um, you know, our, our, uh, the guy over at, um, truth seekers, um, Steve, um, um, I don't know why I can never remember how to pronounce his last name. Steve Cambium. 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 Uh, Steve Cambium uh, did a really, really good show. I'll provide a link to it. It's it's actually, um, you know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes his shows aren't my thing. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, and um, you know, he had he had the um, the author of that um, of that um, um, other film, the What About Lou, on with him, and uh, and he was dialoguing with um, with this this other researcher whose name. Uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, I believe Craig was his name. Uh, you know, basically, and it was actually it was a good dialogue going on between them. It was actually a very interesting um, exchange between them because what became clear at one point is that um, the two guys on the podcast and and the researcher who was who was who was chatting with them, they were basing a lot of their 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 conclusions on his research, but they had come to a different conclusion than he had, and they were surprised by that. And then they actually went through the process of reconciling it between the two of them, which was actually a really interesting thing to listen to. But what I want to really get to is the the kind of the highlights of what of what popped out through this whole process, because what's happened is, is that while there has been some confusion about the the actual identity of the of the landowners, um, there is a, there is a belief now that the real uh, people involved because it, it does appear it does appear that there are there's two sets of individuals well let, let, me, let, me, let me stop you Please right go. there because i think what we have to do is we for a number of our listeners we have to take them back to understand what this anjali oh, that's a good version point. is all about that's a good point that's a good point yeah please go ahead dave <laughs> well that's kind of your job here i'm interviewing <laughs> you i'm but... kidding i'm kidding i'll do it i'll do it um so, um, so she, so she is, like I said, she's, she's, she's fun. I, 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 I have to admit, uh, some bias in that, uh, on a personality level, I, I like her, um, uh, her background, um, as a, um, as an intelligence, um, uh, officer, uh, has checked out. Um, it was, um, some time ago, um, and, and it wasn't, um, you know, I don't think she put in, you know, uh, 30 years, but, um, she's, uh, her, all that really kind of, you know, checked out. So her background appears to be what it, what she said it was. But essentially what's happened is, is that this one researcher has been able to actually interview the landowner and the gentleman tells a very, very different story with a couple very interesting highlights. That's Charlie Weiser, by the way. Charlie Weiser. Yeah, yeah, correct. So, 
Anyway. The idea was behind this that Anjali said that a few years ago she went over to these people's houses and this gentleman named Wayne took her into a tunnel in the mountain by his house and there was aliens in there. And she was going to bring an entire board and had Wayne's permission to bring people in there to make this contact with extraterrestrials that were living underground. I'm sorry. Yes, but yeah, but but I'm sorry. So what what I was trying to get to is it is it so she's been telling this whole this whole story for some time, and uh, everyone's been skeptical, but there has been very little data one way or the other. It's just been basically on her word. And now what we have is we have a a interview with the landowner where the landowner basically goes through and very methodically um, uh, lays out the event. Uh, in contrast to how she lays it out. And there are stark differences between the two. Um, and um, both of them are aware of this. Um, and and they've actually they've actually discussed it between themselves, the fact that they see this so differently. And they have not been able to um, to come to any consensus between the two of them. So what are some of these disagreements? Well, so, so some of the more mechanical ones are the fact that, you know, there was obviously questions about um, uh, clarity of mind um, and whether there were any uh, drugs involved. Um, and while she claimed that there were none, uh, what um, what Wayne basically said was that uh, there there was a cannabis oil that was used and that um, that it was not a cannabis oil that he felt was, um, you know, uh, significantly impactful. It's very confusing as to what he meant by cannabis oil, because typically that would be like a, a CDB oil, which would have no intoxicating effects. But there are people who refer to oils as other things that do have THC in them. So it's unclear to anyone whether it actually had any uh, psychoreactive elements in, in, in what she consumed. But it is being brought up as a point of, of contention that essentially she said that there was nothing consumed and Wayne very quickly you know, said, oh, no, actually, we'd all taken this cannabis oil and, and then we went on a walk. Right. And and he actually says that he felt that her experience was influenced by the oil. He Wayne actually says that. So so there is there is significant reason to mention it. You know, I, I think it's hard because I think a lot of cases people are seeing things while they're um, in uh, relaxing areas, doing relaxing things. And so they're likely to be a little bit intoxicated. And so just because you are a little bit intoxicated doesn't mean you didn't see something. However, if some of the parties you're with actually believe that what you saw was the direct result of something you consumed, that might be a data point that, you know, some might care about. So um, as far as, far as you know, it goes on, basically uh, what Wayne says is that um, he, doesn't, he doesn't contest the digging of the tunnel directly or the location of the tunnel directly. He contests the complete existence of the tunnel uh, in, in entirety. Um, claims that there was never any tunnel. Uh, he has no idea what she's talking about at all. Um, he claims that there was no contact uh, with any sort of entities of, or, or aliens of any sort. Um, furthermore, he says that the night, the actual night of the event, um, she said nothing to him or his wife about the tunnels or the contact, um, did not mention it. Um, now, one of the greatest things about this is that there was a, um, a, uh, a health check called by the daughter to the location for Angeli. And so there was an ambulance that was actually sent out and they did a, a, a check on her. Um, it's unclear exactly what they did, but but they did some sort of a welfare check on her. Uh, and so we have the records or, or I shouldn't say we Steve has the records of of this of this event. So we do know that she was on the property at a given date. And everyone agrees with that with that data point. Right um, now, the uh, one of the other things that came out was that at one point when they were debating the details and their deltas between the details, um, that, um, that basically he offered to sell her the land, all of it, like sight unseen for $10 million and said, you can do whatever you want with it. And, um, what was interesting was that instead of just saying no, or, or saying that she'd look into it, according to her, him, she made some offhanded comment about the fact that, 
Bigelow would pay twice that for much less land with much less activity on it, or something like that. Like, so in, in, like right. why should John? Up gonna, in hold on, right there. Yeah. We're going to continue the Anjali talk and the strange coincidences. I have a couple questions for you as well, John, regarding this. The unbiased UFO report with John Hudson returns right after this on Spaced Out Radio. I'll be right back, dude. Hi, low pro. How you doing? God, this story's gotten complicated fast. Yeah. I really think that if you're going to invent a story, out of the kindness of your heart, you should invent a simple story. Very few details. Not only does it make it easier to, you know, keep track of it, but it's kinder to the rest of us because, you know, it's a lot of work to learn your stories. And, you know, it... yeah. You can't pattern weed. She's always complicated. Yeah, I guess any good story is. Sorry, buddy. I had to blow my nose. It's all good, my friend. <clears throat> all right. Uh, race fan, we'll get into that momentarily. <clears throat> Do... What's with the new lights up, John? We can see you. Oh, just been playing with them a little bit. So, you know, people were complaining, so that'll make it a little better. Almost time to move back into the garage, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It warms up a little bit now. Yeah. Warms up? The snow is melting here, man. Yeah, well, it, it's just been, it, it's, it's better now. It's been a little cold in the garage, so that's why I've been having to stay out of there. Oh, yeah. It must be like 50 degrees in there. Holy cow. Just shrivel my tits up. Yeah, massive false flag uh, with Russia threatening nuclear war. That's right. Come on, Hively Spee. Don't fall for the propaganda on the other side either. What is that? Oh, sorry. I, I was just looking up. I was just looking at one of the other stories I want to talk about. <clears throat> sorry, playing by accident. <laughs> Bob Birkins, you're you're drinking too much Brute Thirty Three again from Grandpa's aftershave area. All right. <clears throat> 
trying to remember to send you the text so you can actually click on the links instead of a picture that you can actually click on links with. I apologize, I kept doing that to you. Oh, I didn't mind. I didn't mind. Uh, Saraj Kumar Shastri, this gentleman out of India, uh, he, he's a guru, and he sends me best wishes and prayers every night at this time. It's awesome. I love it. Alien Critter, how you doing? I post things sometimes. Welcome to the show. A big thank you to Tim, Ed, Michael, Stephen, and Thomas for the amazing Super Chats tonight. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you very much. Here we go. Round at third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Appreciate you each and all tuning on in. Want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on with the fedora wearing John Hudson and the unbiased UFO report. We're talking about Anjali. Now, this is a lady who claimed that she met this guy Wayne and his wife Trish, and they took her to this mountain on their property in California, went into this cave, and there were aliens in there. But now, Wayne and Trish are like, um, there was no aliens. And Jolly was tripping on some some devil's lettuce oil, and we don't know what the hell she's talking about, and we want nothing to do with this. That's pretty much the gist of it. Right there, John? Yes. And, and let me just point out that I have had a lot of friends who have played with the devil lettuce and none of them have ever uh, told me that it brought them aliens as just you know a side note. well you know hey aliens can pop up at any time man aliens can pop up at any time but uh, anjali is actually defending her her notion and her side of this compared to everybody else yes oh no no she still completely stands by her story and and you know she she basically holds that um that that you know that that wayne uh is 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 covering it up um and that um <clears throat> you know she doesn't claim to know why but you know hold on a second excuse me she doesn't claim to know why he's covering it up but um you know her claim is that um it did happen and that he's making it up and um and you know and and her claim is that you know it did really happen. And so you have him basically saying that, you know, he basically believes that what happened to her was either, um, you know, was essentially, um, you know, hallucinations brought on by the oil. Um, the, um, what was interesting was, was it, um, uh, that became kind of predominant hypothesis in the conversation for what might've triggered what she saw. And then the um, the the researcher, the, uh, Craig, who actually you know did the work, he was the one that came back and said, no, 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 that's actually not what I believe. What I believe happened is that she had other things happen to her, either through meditation or through other drug adventures. She had other events, and she conflated them in her memories, and that's what he thinks happened. You know what? I mean, John, could it be as simple as this? Okay, the way the UFO crowd took off after this story and the way Anjali kind of made a spectacle of it, it would be very easy to see this Wayne and Trish to all of a sudden say, look, 
what the hell is she doing? What What is she getting us into? We don't want any part of this. It would be very easy for them to say that. Oh, no. And you could even have a ton of people advising them to do that. Don't ruin your lives. Let her ruin hers. I have this story about this guy that came to this guy, Dave Scott, with these fairy pictures. It's sad. Mm hmm. But I mean, could that be uh, sure, what we're absolutely? Thinking? I mean, no, no, no. I mean, th th that's the rotten part about this. Is it? Is it? For for this to be for this to be in any way, shape, or form conclusive, you have to take the word of these individuals, which may or may not be a wise move. But then you have to ask, why are you taking their word over anyone else's? Right? Because what you have here is you have conflicting observational accounts. Right? with no direct evidence either way. And uh, there is evidence that the event, that they were all at that location on that evening. So that's good. I mean, it's actually, it's really nice. In the future, everyone should call welfare checks for, for paranormal events. That was actually a very helpful thing to have happen. That became a, a great checkpoint for the whole story. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but you know, here's the thing. Okay. So, you know, if someone were to ask me personally, um, you know, do, do I, do I believe her? You know, no, I don't necessarily believe that what she believes happened happened, but I am in agreement even with, with, with Steve who said that he believes that she believes what she's saying is true. And I do, I, I believe that she believes that she's being honest. Now I don't know what actually happened, but I do believe that she's being honest. So to me, it's, it's a question of, of how, how did she come to believe this? And did she come to believe this because of some real event or did she come to believe this because of some other event? Either way, it's actually probably something we would like to know. And let's face it, when you look at all the stories that you hear from experiencers of screen memories and, and memory manipulation and all that stuff, is it really that far fetched that both of their memories were messed with? I mean, it's very hard to tell. It's so frustrating. It is totally frustrating. All right, we got to move on here, man, as we continue on with the UFO report. Ross Coltart, Ralph Blumenthal, two yeah. reputable reporters, journalists, investigative journalists, meeting for the first time. Well, first off, I was surprised. Like, I would have thought those two would have run into each other at some point in their careers. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I guess, you know, geography being what it is. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, but no, first time them getting together and, uh, and they did it uh, on, a, on a YouTube panel. Um, and um, I, I didn't actually, um, I didn't get a chance to actually get terribly deep into it. And to be honest with you, um, these kind of interviews, I, I kind of like to listen to the first time, like, as a, as a, as a geek, like, like I just like to enjoy it, you know, sort of thing instead of kind of tearing it all apart. Um, so I really encourage everyone to go check it out. But what I think is so interesting about it is, is it, is it what we have is we have, um, we've, I guess, we've all talked and lamented over the years about the fact that there weren't many, like, not just real journalists, but, but good journalists that were paying this story, you know, its dues. And now we've reached a point where we have multiples doing it and we have enough of them doing it that we, we, have the, we have the time to take two of them and put them on a pedestal like this and get a little excited about the fact that they're talking for the first time and make something, make a big deal out of it, you know, and which is kind of cute, you know, but the, but the point is, is that we finally have enough good journalists that we can actually do that. Right. I mean, it's like, what a change, right? I mean, it wasn't that many. I mean, look, I mean, you're you're far more sensitive to this than, than I am, right? I mean, it's like how, how many how many years were you just hoping that at some point we would get just three or four of them that could take it seriously? You know. Well, I I agree, I agree. The problem that we have with the journalism right now is we have a bunch of editors who don't want to run these stories. Number one and number two. We have nobody in North America on the television side outside of the of the bow tie wearing 
Tucker Carlson, who wants to actually delve into this either, but he asks a bunch of fluff ball questions about it. And I have a solution to this, and, and I offer a challenge to everyone listening. What we need is we need sponsors that want this story sold. So what we need is we need UFO products. So everyone's going to go out there and invent you, and then we can sell UFO products. Because this is the problem: is that what what sells on on these shows is is things about uh, toilet paper and napkins because that's what the advertise. You know what I'm saying? It's like this is very much a a a, a consumer fed problem in many ways. There, there's no advertisers begging for UFO content. Well, I understand that. I understand that. But let's let's get back to the point. Ralph Blumenthal is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. We have Ross Coulthart, who's an Emmy Award winning journalist out of Australia. And not, not just not not just that. I, I would say that, that that what you have here is you have you have two people who are 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 actual peers in in the best sense of the word in that that you have two gentlemen who uh, both after having a good career decided to use up some of their their credits to explore a very fringe topic right um did so by writing very 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 impactful books and both ended up being um at the forefront of mainstream media content in their each of their respective countries that vastly changed this entire story. So, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, I call, I call it cute, but the truth of the matter is, is that, I mean, those guys are, are as, as, as close as you get to, to Titans, at least, you know, for the present, for the present moment. Right. Well, I, and I agree with you, but the point that I was getting is, you know, we have two major, journalists here who know what they're talking about, who know how to cover a story, you know, what's the overall outlook from them regarding the UAP story? Well, it's, it's not that it's not that they, um, you know, I don't get any sense that they, that they're, that, that they're ready to, 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 to go anywhere beyond the data they're reporting, which is, I, I really admire in both of them. But what you have is you have, you have, um, a, 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 and I can I can only really point this out for for Ross, so, so I apologize, Ralph. But w- what I see in, in in Ross is I see um, such classic, um, just nose to the grindstone reporting being done for this topic, and and it, that sounds silly, but in many ways that's what's so amazing about it is that is it what you have is you have it, it'd be like it'd be like getting a, a you know. A, a, a professional baseball player to come play some other sport for it and, and take it seriously. Right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it, uh, it, it's, it's just, it, it, it was, um, I, I don't know. It's I, to me, it's hard to kind of put a, a nail on, but what you have is you have them looking into, um, you know, very specific details. So, you know, for example, you have Ross, um, uh, trying to follow up on the, um, on the atomic weld that the um, that the Navy architect reported to him as being discovered, um, you know, trying to track that down. You you know you have you, you in, classically, I believe we have a lot of cases where data gets reported and no one follows up on it, and or or follow up is very minimal. And what you have with with Ross and and certainly with with Ralph Blumenthal. Um, uh, with his books to it to the nines, you have um, a you know, just dogged researchers that just just dig and dig and dig and and you know to me one of the reasons why I like listening to Ross is that he often finds things that I didn't or 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 comes to insights that I didn't think of and and it's like hey wow that was cool like good thinking. We got to move on here. Elizondo talking Roswell. We mentioned this briefly last week too. Yeah, well, I just wanted to break, make sure we brought it up because I know it was a story that meant a lot to you, Dave. But, um, but yeah, so it, so the UFO Garage guys, you know, once again did this great, great story. I just want to mention it again because I'm so proud of what they did, and, and I just thought it'd be a fun thing to mention because I know the Roswell stuff means so much to you, Dave. Um, and I want to make sure everyone heard about it. Um, you know, basically in their interview, uh, uh, he actually gives an a, uh, I don't know if you can call it an update for Roswell, but he gives. He gives um, unnecessary data about Roswell and basically uh, it, it, you know, it infers that there was some event, infers that there was um, more than one uh, crash location 
and um, and and makes a rather um, derogatory comment about the ridiculousness of needing that much gear to pick up a weather balloon. So um, you know he dances very carefully, but um, he is trying super 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 hard to uh, you know play those lines right. I loved it. I you know what the funny part. Awesome. Of, you know what the funny part about it is. Ben and Joe, I talked to Ben after that from UFO Garage. He didn't even know the magnitude of what was about what Elizondo just said. He was oh, so awesome. jaw dropped, he didn't know how to how to respond. That's it was awesome. phenomenal. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's my perfect. That's beautiful. My friend, we got to say good night here. I I know uh, we're going to cut it a story short, but we could save that for a, a couple days from now. Yep, Another yep, great yep. report. From the Thank fedora you, wearing John Hudson on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you, sir. All right, let's get to Shirky Poo's news, who has us all set up tonight. A New York family is suing a Staten Island cemetery after a massive 900 kilogram headstone fell and struck and killed their matriarch. Yep. Apparently, Elvira Navarro, 53 years old, and her son Anthony Rosales were groundskeeping and tending graves at the Baron Hirsch Cemetery in October of 2021 when a stone monument toppled over and fell on top of her. Navarro died later that day of her injuries at Richmond University Hospital. Her son, according to the lawsuit, was working beside her and witnessed the event that killed his mother. The physical and psychological effects on him are severe physical pain and mental anguish, as described in the lawsuit. The suit seeks unspecified damages from the Baron Hirsch Cemetery Association, alleging they failed to maintain the site property. The mother of five, Navarro, and her son had been hired by a third party to work at the Staten Island burial ground. Details of the lawsuit do not specify where in the cemetery the deadly mishap happened. Either way, that's a bad way to go. Bad way to go. How'd you like to be this guy? You know, he's been having troubles breathing for years, and they finally figured out why. A New York man actually uh, was having some breathing issues out of his nose, and he was pretty stunned when doctors found a half-inch long tooth growing inside his nasal passage. The 38-year-old had reported to the doctor after experiencing breathing difficulties for several years. After an examination, it was found that the man had a deviated septum, I know what that's like, and bone-like growths in his nose. The man's face looked normal, though, which prompted a follow-up. Oral and maxillofacial surgeons uh, conducted a rhinoscopy, worst pain ever, a nasal exam done by a tube, like an instrument with a light and lens, whereupon they discovered a hard, non-tender white mass poking through the floor of his right nostril. Well, when they checked it out even closer, it ended up being an ectopic tooth, which is defined as having a grub grinder in an abnormal place. The condition is exceedingly rare and normally entails teeth sprouting up in the jawbone under the gum rather than into the nose a condition that affects 0.1 to 1% of the population, according to a 2019 study. Yep, they pulled the tooth out, and now he's doing okay, and he can breathe fine. A Nova Scotia couple, whose three-year-old bulldog gave birth to a litter of eight puppies, say they immediately noticed something pretty unusual about one of these cute little newborns. Her fur was dyed green. Trevor and Audra Mosher of Middle Sackville said they had brought their dog Freya, or thought their dog Freya, was finished after delivering her seven puppies, but while they were cleaning the canine mother, she started to go into labor again. Freya delivered an eighth puppy, this time encased in a black sack, contrasting the, with the other translucent sacks of its older siblings. The couple said they initially feared the puppy was stillborn, but they rushed to clean the newborn canine when she startled, started to move. We started to dry her off, and then we noticed she was green and immediately again thought there was something wrong, so we Googled it. My puppy is green. What's wrong? And apparently it's very rare, and it happened a few times all over the world. The rare discoloration, which has been documented before, 
is believed to be caused by light-colored puppies coming into contact with the green pigments from bile while in the womb. Uh, it's still a cute puppy. Very, very healthy. All right, and finally tonight, a Virginia sheriff's office is thanking a goat, yeah, a goat, for assisting deputies during a foot pursuit with a fleeing suspect this month. The goat named Gracie helped two deputies flush out a suspect they were chasing back on February 13th. Yeah, so sometimes help comes in all shapes and sizes. The sheriff's office wrote on their Facebook page, Captain Scott Barker said Deputy David Pardell came across a suspect while investigating a domestic assault case, and after telling the suspect he was under arrest, the suspect fled on foot, leading Parnell to chase him through a fence line and across a field. During the chase, Barker said a goat from the property then joined the deputy. While Parnell's and the goat reached the next line of the fence, the goats continued through the fence in front of the deputy and chased the man into the woods. As Parnell surveyed the situation, the goat and a deputy on the other side flushed the man out of the woods. He was taken into custody. Barker said the goat was returned to its owner after the incident was resolved. Authorities have yet to provide the names of the subject or whether or not that goat will be officially deputized. I think it should. Put it on the payroll. Here's your thought of the day, Eve. What cryptid scares you the most and why? Science Bob, the one I cannot see coming through the portal that just opened behind me. Terry, Dogman, it's a freaking werewolf, dude. Nothing good about it. Thin Lizzy, Chalupa Cabra, because I want some Chalupas and it takes them. Jessica, the rake is pretty creepy. Michael, oil pit squids, because they are very real and right out of an X file. The Wendigo creeps out Karen. Uncle Dale and his power stash, possibly resurgent ex-late night talk show host with frightening reputations. Ooh, Chris, Yif Kings, they are royalty, royal pains in the butt. Let's go to Ron Wendigo, because being taken over by a cannibal spirit and hurting the people you love would suck. Scott, just look at the fear of the cryptid entity Justin Trudeau has brought. Oh, yeah. Oh. That scares like 36 million people, Scott. Be careful. You almost gave me a heart attack there. All right. And we got time for one more. Nicole Sackage, my doppelganger. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Day. Thank you to Shirky Pooh for the news. John Hudson for the UFO report. Swamp Dweller for another spooky story. And Lon Strickler coming in for Strange Days. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, and on Twitter. And hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends... We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. That's a good, solid show all around. I'm impressed with that one there, Johnny B. Good. Oh. You can unmute yourself. I was just saying, yeah, that was fun times. That was fun times.
Yep. Good. Good. Uh, good. Good. good, good, right, good right. Uh, let's report that one there. Unwanted. There we go. We will remove it. Says YouTube. <clears throat> Do 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 be careful what, what news you read these days. Some of oh my god, there. it is terrible. Yeah. Oh. Ow. There we go. There we go. So, I'm liking hey, the hair, my hair again. Last okay. week I didn't like my hair. I'm starting to like my hair again. Important to like your hair. When mm -hmm. you don't like your hair, your hair knows. Oh, I know. I know, but I'm starting to love it again. I'm sure you two will be very happy together. We are. You know, makes me happy. You know. So, Dave, have you heard anything? I, I, I'm, I'm going to start, like, I'm going to start asking you and Duke about this, like, every, like, 24 hours until I get an answer. Like, is there anything new about that more film from the Patterson Gimlin film? I don't know. Duke would be the guy to know. Oh, nuts. I want to see it. Duke would totally be the dude to know next. <sighs> Very frustrating. Uh, Alien Critter, I did not pick up the uh, Taco Bell seasoning packets yet. I haven't had time. It is on the list, though, of things I need to accomplish. Can't believe February's over already. My goodness. Well, I'm just <clears throat> very, very happy that um, the hours are about to be adjusted back to normal. Oh my God, I hate time change. I just, Why I, I just. Uh, the, the changing of it's hard, but I've just discovered that I just, I don't, I don't like the. Uh, the hour earlier, the sun going down, it just, it just, it, it messes with me. Hi, Bliss B. You and I are going to debate again. The Patterson Gimlin footage is not fake. It is not fake. Nobody in the 1960s is going to sew a pair of tits on a costume. You know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I understand people fighting about that film. Over the years, I get it. I totally get it. I get. I, I totally get. It. But if you if you now go into like 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 the Google academic search engine and do a search, you will find numerous academic papers written on that film that dig into very specific details about that film that have come to absolutely no conclusions whatsoever at all of anything being faked. I mean, and trust me, they've tried. They've tried really hard, but to put all that aside, you look at the now the 100 frames per second 4K upscale of that film, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, like if if that if that if that had been the original film released, it would have never been debated. Like I don't see how anyone can look at that upscaled film and think that's fake. Like that 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 blows my mind. Nobody's like, showing a pair of tits on the on the uh, on the costume. They just aren't. Even, uh, even the Imagineers. Trey Larkin Australia wants to know where you can find the Ralph and Ross interview. Um, it is on. Uh, it is on yeah. YouTube, and it is. Um, um, blah, I think I put it in my. Uh, Dave, if you, I don't know if you can do this easily or not. If you can, I can do it in a minute. Uh, I, the, the, the link to it is, um, is the, is the URL, uh, at li uh, oh, listed as number two. I got it here. Yeah. And if you just post it to the chat. Oh, that's people, not yeah. the one. Sorry. Uh, where is it here? It's, no, it's uh, in, in no. number two. Is that it? No, that should be it. Uh, is that not it. Did I post the wrong link. Oh, I did. Uh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the wrong link. Uh, yeah. let's see. Sorry, Johnny. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, let's see, where is it? Um, let's see here. Um, do, do, do. 
We will agree to disagree, High Lithalis B. I'm not saying it isn't possible, but you can't think of that in a 21st century mind. You have to think of that in a 1967 perspective. People weren't just sewing tits on costumes because they thought it would be a good laugh. It was still a very enclosed society back then. <clears throat> not, not to mention the, 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 how do I say this? The quality of the, of the special effects that were done for those body parts is, I'm sorry. I just, I, I'm not convincing myself of, uh, I'm, I'm not convincing myself of anything. I think the problem is we're looking at it in a 20, 20th or late 20th and 21st century mind where we're not paying attention to what the attitudes were in the 1960s, which were very conservative. And yes. nobody is going to all of a sudden decide to sew a pair of tits on a monkey costume, right? Especially not for the <clears throat> purposes of, of making it look authentic. Especially not when the fact that those things, that, that those kind of details were not. I mean, it was it was certainly talked about and debated beforehand, but it's not until that you see the upscaled version of it that you can really discern any details. I think without that upscale, I think I think you know, I can understand people still wanting to debate it. I think after you've seen that upscale, I don't. I I just I don't get it. I really don't. That upscale is insane. It's, it's it's Dude, just, in the 1960s, they were still measuring bathing suits at beaches in California and New York across the United States because the, the bathing suits couldn't be over a, an inch above the knee. Who was responsible for doing that measurement? There was a dude who actually was responsible. Pardon me, in the 60s, the, ba the bathing suit and the bikinis came out. Okay, that's wow. probably a good example. So there that used was to be career path. By, by law enforcement officers where they would go to the beach and they would actually measure bikinis to make sure that women weren't straying from the rules and going over a, a half Billy, inch. Billy, little Billy comes home from school. Mom, Dad, I know what I want to be when I grow up. <clears throat> that's terrible, man. I can't believe someone did that for a living. Actually, that role probably went to the um, whoever donated the most money to the guy's campaign. <laughs> oh, you definitely know whoever was measuring. He was very, very church oriented. Oh man, oh, it just boggles the mind. Absolutely boggles the mind. Boggles the mind. <coughs> Can you imagine the men of the day seeing like, like those bikini thongs that uh, the girls are wearing? Now, they would have a heart attack, absolute heart attack. And I got to tell you, I, I would enjoy watching that so much. I, um, I, I, I have such disdain for. Um, judgmental laws <laughs> just in general i just ugh, i have such a disdain for it uh hold on i gotta cut out a cough here from lawn perfect lawn was amazing tonight yeah, he did really well. I missed some of it because I was um, listening to that. To, to <clears throat> see a bit. I almost lost it once. Almost lost it once. And Nicole Sackage sent, I'm blaming her for it, because she actually sent me a note uh, that read, it was, it was just beautiful. Um. She goes, I think Butch is smiling and is proud of you right now. Nice. And I was just nice. like, 
I that all I had to send her a note back that basically said, uh, "Don't make me cry," because I would have. You, lost you know what it. I love about that, and I I, I, I got to call it because you know we all we all are in situations where you know we hear that little voice in our heads and we we get an, an inkling to do something like that. We get an inkling to send someone a message or to tell someone something. And we just get this feeling that it's just something we should do. And often we don't. We don't follow through on it. And we need to. And that's what she did. And that's how you got that message. And, you know, it's probably a message you needed to hear at this time and, and it, with everything going on, right? I mean, not to say that you wouldn't have been okay without it, but hearing it, you know, is nice, right? It's, it's a good thing to hear, you know? It was. It was very sweet. Yeah, that's cool. Very sweet. Very that's kind. super cool. Very kind. Our man, Ethereal Aura, hasn't come to visit yet. Then again, I'm sure he's comforting family right now. <clears throat> One day that note will fall. I just know it. One day that's going to fall during the show. Something I find so odd about you, Dave, is, is that you 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 seem to have so much confidence in your belief of the sustainment of 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 human consciousness beyond death, and then at the same time, you you still have this tremendous apprehension toward it. I think it's very. I think it's fascinating. Uh, I have faith, but I question my faith. And the what if scares me. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I, I, I can see that because, because, you know, a little bit of self doubt feels humbling sometimes in a good way. Right. And, um, and, um, and, and sometimes that can bring a little bit of, that can bring a little balance. Right. Um, you know, although I, 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 to this day, one of my absolute favorite, 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 paranormal stories is this one that um i i'm i'm 99 sure it came out in um uh leslie uh leslie Chin's book I, I believe her book um about death is the one where this story came out where it was these mufon investigators who went to go investigate this uh, old woman that was haunting ha uh, uh, haunting this house with this kid and this couple and the the ghost had made friends with the kid and was actually like watching TV with the kid and helping the kid with his homework and giving the kid like dating advice and like had become like part of this family. Right. It's an amazing story. But one of the best parts of the story is, is that the, the, the woman explains through the kid because the kid's the only person who can hear the woman. So they have to interview the, the spirit through the kid, you know? And so, uh, you know, assuming you believe all this, and uh, and so through via the kid, what the woman says is that um, that that she was a good Catholic, but that she wasn't a perfect Catholic, and that she's just a little too fearful that if she does pass on, that she'll end up in purgatory. And she loves her house, and so she's decided it's just better to stay here. I could see that. <laughs> so, so, and so that's why I asked about about what was your logic? Was your logic that you believe it's real, but you don't, you don't, you're not sure you're going to like what it is, or is it you have some doubt? And so you just have some doubts in general about whether you're analyzing it properly, and and that 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 makes both. This to me is different. This is like this is this is contextual. This is not semantic, right? This is not physical. This is like content. Uh, this is a content issue. <laughs> Cracks me up. That is kind of cool. Makes me laugh. <clears throat> oh, hi, Mystics Walk. How are you? Evan Walters, good to see you. Yeah, Bomber, we uh, we lost Butch on January 13th. That was a hard one. I'm not going to lie. That was a hard one. Yep. Yes, it was. Even for those of us that didn't know him very well, he was. Yeah, I, I agree. Alan Watts, I love Alan Watts. I love Alan Watts so much. And you know, uh, for those of you that have ever like been impacted by Alan Watts over your lives, yeah. like so many of us have, uh, his son now has a podcast 
and it's pretty good. And one of the features of his podcast is he is republishing the entire Alan Watts archive. Uh, and with his commentary and this other guys on the front end about, about the talk and what was said and, and like stories he heard from his dad. Like it, it's cool. It's, it's, if you like Alan Watts, it's, it's really worth checking out. Uh, Solaire, uh, you got that a little confused. Uh, ethereal aura is the one who had the doctor assisted, uh, passing, uh, last week. Yeah. That was on Friday. He came to say, say good, no Thursday. He came to say goodbye. <clears throat> Butch passed away in his sleep. It's last Thursday. Yeah. We kept the chat room open until 1 a.m. That was the night you left, John, right after you left. Right. Because you had to go, yep. and then Ethereal Aura came in and... Yeah, because I, I was listening, but but I wasn't on, yeah. Yeah, I came to say goodbye because yep, he, yeah, uh, uh, he had severe COPD. He couldn't breathe on his own and was basically... At a very young age, capacitated. He was only forty-three years old. That's a crazy. And uh, so he said that when he got to uh, when he got to the other side and got comfortable, I've got this sticker here with his name on it, February twenty-fifth, twenty twenty-two. And I said to him point blank, "When you're ready and you want to come catch a show, come on into the studio." And I said, when you're here, do me a favor. Just remove that. Just make that fall. Then we'll know it's you. I think that's fair. And he said he would do his best once he got to the other side. <clears throat> you know, I think it's really good when people do that. Um, you know, um, 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 oh, Targ. Um, Russell. Targ. Russell Targ. Um, his daughter was a brilliant, brilliant woman. And sadly she was lost, I believe about five years ago or maybe more, I believe it was brain cancer or it was something like that. It was very serious. It was very sad, but she was also a researcher like her dad and they worked out a communication method and she improved it <laughs> and actually communicated to him via someone else in a language that person didn't know. So she knew to pick a language that the person who got the message didn't know so they would have to re replicate it to her father verbatim and her father would be able to decode the message because he knew the language. That's cool. That is really, really, really cool. Yeah, that is really, really cool. There, there, Russell has actually done, done some work uh, with her since her passing. Wow, I didn't know that. Not, not, I know very little. I know very, very little. And as far as I know, it, it might have been just really, you know, um, coincidental, like just, you know, early things. I don't know yeah. if there's anything, you know, organized, but, um, yeah. but to me, it's like whenever, you know, and I think all of us, I think all of us should be, should think about this. Like all of us that have, um, you know, for whatever reason decided to, to hedge our bets on, on a, a different a different telling than what we were taught as kids and, and maybe a different telling than what everyone else is running around with in their heads. And, mm -hmm. you know, as we're all getting up there, we have an opportunity to do things like that, to set stuff up, you know, it set stuff up beforehand so that we can all basically reach out afterwards. And, 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 and it, it does, I mean, you listen mm -hmm. to, you listen to um, like Leslie Keen uh, talk about things that like, 
that like happened with Bud Hopkins after after he passed. And I don't care if it's real. <laughs> it helped her tremendously, right? I mean, tremendously. Did tremendous good for her mental health, right? So I think it's awesome. Uh, well, quick shout out to Big J, who lost his stepdad last Saturday after four weeks in hospital. Big J, uh, much love to you, and we'll send you some love, man, from all of us here at Spaced Out Radio. Uh, sorry to hear about your loss, my friend. Thank you. And uh, uh, Grand Paul Holland, I hope your flooding isn't too bad. Uh, yeah. Hope you're okay. Yeah, losing people is really hard. I, I lost I lost my mom and my grandmother in uh, October of 2017 within two weeks of each other. And, oh you know, shit! It's always it's always very difficult. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, and my my nana was like one of my best friends, so it was, it was really hard. I'm telling. But I did you, get I... to make a joke. I did get to make a great joke at the uh, at the. Um, at the funeral, um, that, uh, that I thought it was, um, you know, just a little bit, um, I don't remember what I said. I think it was, I said it was a little bit typical or a little bit that my, that my grandmother uh, had to get up and die right after my mom did. So she could upstage your funeral <laughs> and everyone laughed. It was awesome. It actually worked out well. They were, they were very close though. I, uh, I read the eulogy at my uncle's funeral. Oh, this is about a decade ago or so now. Oh, God, longer than that. God, I, I had people laughing. Because, you know, I just figured, you know what? Everybody's going to be there giving the same shit. I'm like, no way. I had a hilarious time with them. Look, and you know what? I mean, you know, if, if, if 10 year jokes, you know, if each one of those jokes only works on one person, you know, it's one person that you got to just for 30 seconds, forget all their problems and just laugh, you know, and it's just, there's, oh, yeah. uh, you know, honestly, like making someone, you know, I, I hate to make a big deal out of it because I think people try too hard to make people laugh. But the truth of the matter is, is making someone else laugh is a, is one of the greatest it's gifts you can ever give anyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we, uh. We had a bunch of good laughs at his. So, so someone asked a question earlier about about um, ghosts being peeping toms, and it, it actually uh, triggered a, a question for me that I had a while ago. That I wanted to ask you, Dave. Uh, when you consider the number of times that most people in their lives get um, a, the sense that someone's looking at them, and they look, and someone is, and then the number of times that they get a sense someone's looking at them, and they look. And it's not that the person, the people there aren't looking at them. It's that nothing is there, like nothing is there at all. Um, do you think it's it's at all possible that, that what those people are picking up are remote viewers? Could be. Could be. I doubt it. I doubt it, but it could be. On a personal level, I would say no. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's what I was asking. You can't, you can't rule it out. Uh, Steam Train Mark, we have had major flooding event which covers a very large area in southeast Queensland. Currently, a lot of houses are underwater. Eight people are are at lost lives. Everything that goes with all oh, that's terrible. Well, you guys, last year it was the fires. This year it's flooding, which makes sense. <clears throat> There's always horrible flooding after a fu major fire. Always. Nothing to stop it. Nothing to stop it. That's right. You should see my front yard, man. It's almost empty of snow because my big trees in my front yard have already sucked up all the uh, the melted snow water. Just cool. <clears throat> The rest of my yard is filled with snow, except around my big trees. So, so when it's when it's like deep winter like that, do most of the critters vanish? Yeah. It's the only time so we the, don't have bugs. 
so it's, is, it, is, is, it, is it quieter? No. The noise is the same. Actually, it gets louder because of the snowmobiles. Oh. Oh. Is anyone doing electric snowmobiles yet? I don't think so. Some of those are so much fun, but to me, like, it's always been like such a, um, uh, a, a juxtaposition to be like blowing through all this pristine white, you know, hillsides, shooting, you know, combustion fumes out the back of your vehicle. You know, like I, as much fun as it is, like that's one thing I love about snowboarding is that like, I, I, I can I can cut through like, you know, pristine snow that no one's touched yet. And like the only damage I've done is I've, you know, I've left a trail for someone else to follow if they want, you know. But there's so many, there's so few snowmobilers. We got bigger worries in the environment than snowmobiles. Oh, I don't mean that I'm worried about it as some kind of a general environmental problem. I just mean me personally. I just, I've never liked the idea that because I've been behind snowmobiles before. And it's like one of the reasons why I go up there is to breathe clean, fresh air. And smelling a snowmobile is, is awful when you're trying to get a breath of mountain air, you know? Then you wouldn't like my side by side. Well, it depends too what you're going out for. I mean, like if, you, if you're going out, you know, if you're going out four wheeling, then you know you're planning on having to deal with the smell. You know, <clears throat> I love ripping around on my side by side, man. I cannot wait to get back out there. Got to get new tires for it this year. Get a new trailer mm -hmm. for it. Oh, yeah. Going to go booting in my side-by-side. -side. What does booting mean? Go for a rip. Just like me, like throwing your gear and just spin around and... Throw your gear in and go for a long ride. <clears throat> go out in the morning and don't come back until the headlights are on. All right, no, no, I get that. I get that. I, I, when I when I had my Harley, there were certainly times where that you know the sort of uh, you know get out early and just you know ride until you can, and you know certainly were really, really, really nice, really relaxing, very rewarding adventures. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. so much fun. There's something I was going to ask you. So much fun. Just go for a big boat all in the yeah. mountains and logging roads i had one time two years ago john where i was i was out with my buddy mike and we were cruising along and all of a sudden this baby black bear runs across the road about 30 feet in front of us i almost smoked the thing <clears throat> and we stop and we're like uh this isn't safe we got to get the hell out of here yeah we're really not. yeah <clears throat> <clears throat> uh evan it's one of those canadian sayings go for a rip you know um in um at one point jim semivan i believe it was does an interview on joe rogan and he tells a bear story where he ran into a bear while hiking and it's fun. <laughs> it's a really good story. It's, it's well worth listening to. It's, it's, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. It was, it was a good story. I'm telling you, all I'm saying is, <clears throat> is that, uh, <clears throat> Um, we have a, uh, I don't want to run into bears. Bears are, bears get angry quick. They have no sense of humor. And then the one area where we ran into grizzly bears, I don't want to run into grizzly bears. Mm-hmm. See, now, this is what I'm talking about. Hold on. 
Ozzy Ange, I saw a bull shark in someone's backyard. It wasn't deep. I'm telling you right now, you people in Australia dealing with these floods, you don't go in that water. You don't go in that water. You oh will die. God. You will Shark die. In backyard. <clears throat> okay. You imagine you're sitting on your patio, stoking the barbecue. You know, you got a couple of steaks on there, and, and you're watching the flood kind of come by, and all of a sudden, 18 foot bull shark decides. Oh, actually, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about this. This is probably your worst nightmare, Dave. Sharks this is up in your own backyard. This, this is probably is exactly bad as why it gets. I'll never go to Australia. That shit will kill you. It will kill you. I, 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 st I still can't get over the fact that they have three hey, Paul, different birds. He's like, he's like, yeah, I, I look out for them north of Mayboro, Maryboro. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's what's happening in the creek? You know, behind the house. I don't know. There's a there's a 28 foot bull shark back there, and the beach ball is floating down, and he's just waiting for you to come get it. No fucking way. None. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Not at all. Mm -mm. Oh, that's horrible. <clears throat> that's one of the, that's one of the things I don't understand about Australia having all these COVID restrictions is everything there can already kill you. What the hell is a mask going to do? What the hell is a pandemic going to do? It can't kill you compared to the snakes, the, the, the sharks, the crocodiles, the, the, the spiders. Yeah. Or the three birds that will let you on fire as part of their exactly. hunting. Exactly. The fire birds. Three different, okay. different birds. Three, three that different entire birds. continent is fucked up. I'm telling you right now. It's, amazing it's fucked thing. up. Right? Next yeah, I mean, thing you if, know, if, there's if, some... a, if a continent has ever said humans will pass, it's, it's also... terrible. It's terrible. And we live there. Whole anyway. place will kill you. It's so pretty, though. Crocodiles. Hey, what's going on? Yo, you're cooking some steaks on the barbecue. I'll come join you for a meal. Yeah, and then that's the exact same time the crocodile shows up on your porch when your kid decides to play a joke and and lock you out of the house. In the meantime, you got a choice. You could go in the water with the 74-foot bull shark or you could go onto your patio and fight a crocodile that's hungry. You're dead either way. And there's probably some snake up in the banner, some black bomba type of bullshit right? That's willing to come down, right? Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Welcome to Australia, motherfucker. That's exactly, yeah, exactly. what happens, John. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. It's, it's one of the few continents I haven't visited. And, uh, and I, 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 part of me is really desperately want that's to why go you're there. Alive. But, that's but, why you're I, alive. I, but I have, I have a challenge with spiders that I'm, I'm working on, but I have a challenge and some of the spiders I have there. And the funny thing is, is it's actually the, it's actually, it's not even the poisonous ones that, that are the ones that to me are the most intimidating. It's those hunter spiders that are like the most intimidating. Yeah. Those things like, those things are actually oh, yeah. like friendly in, in the grand scheme of things, you know? Hold on. Australia flood sharks. Let's go on Twitter. I'm sure there's something on here about this bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, bull shark spotted right there. There's the bullshit right here. Right here. Right off the guy's patio. Hold on a second here. I'll show you this shit. You can't make this up. Oh, let's go to Australia, they said. It'll be fun. Yeah, when you got a, you know, a 36-foot bull shark, you know, right at your feet, just say, look at this thing. It's going to say, come on in. Come on in. I'm sorry. Like I used to be, I used to be worried about the snakes and the spiders. And everything. But when you learn about that little tiny shrimp that you can't see that will, can go up your nose and then you just die. And, yeah. and yeah. that's it. You just die. 
That's and like you two can't even tell. You don't even know. You can't even see it. Like at least a snake, you like. I see the snake. I can run, Goofy, or I can. Sure. I can at least Look scream and, and. It's like eight inches from shore, right there. Bull shark. It? That's a bull shark fin. Oh Look how God. close. Guy's standing on his patio. This thing could jump up and grab him at no time. No time. Yeah, and he ain't giving not. you the old Ozzy Ozzy oi oi. That's for yeah. sure. But, you know, in, in defense it's of that poor shark, that. that's not nice water to be in. Look at that one. Oh, Washed up on flooding roads. Aww. That one I feel bad for, to be blunt. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. you imagine? You can't even go into your garden. Okay? You can't go in there. Why? There's probably a crocodile right there. All right? Somewhere in this bullshit here, there's a snake. All right? And in, in this beautifully trimmed hedge here, there's about 45 snakes. This fucker's filled with spiders that just want to kill you. Right in here, right at the bottom of your stairs, okay, there's a crocodile there, 100%. So, there's an 18-foot so, crocodile there. So you know what's funny, Dave, is that um, there, there there used to be this um, this ceremony that they did um, at um, – at, at, um, uh, uh, you know where that were at Easter Island, you know, and uh, yeah, and they they this would have bullshit. to, sw I know, and, and so they would have to, sw a bunch of them have, would have to swim out to this island, and and get this egg, and then swim back with the egg, and 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 it was like this big contest. Well, you were swimming in open water, and so so sh people would get hit by sharks. Well, according to the history of 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 the island it actually impacted shark migration sharks started coming to easter island to that area at that same time every year because they knew there would be so much good food in the water mm -hmm. and so it makes you wonder with the amount of flooding that occurs in australia if yeah. there aren't all animals out there that are just waiting for the next feast, you know, where they all get to like float into everyone's backyard and take their. <laughs> well, look at this shit, John. Imagine looking out your front yard and all of a sudden there's fucking jaws hanging out there. Jaws, okay. There there's mm -hmm. jaws hanging out in your front yard. Hey, Mary, do you want to toss over a couple of potatoes? I'm a That's little so hungry. Crazy. Here, let me just cross the road. Yeah, bullshit. You're dead, Mary. And by the way, you ain't getting your potatoes either. You know, uh, you gotta wonder, though, that shark, man, boy, that shark's got to be confused. You doesn't know? matter. I mean, seriously. doesn't confused. matter. He's going for human meals here, right? Maybe. This is bullshit. Maybe. <laughs> he might be really, really confused. Yeah, unwanted animals swimming in floodwaters here. Look at these guys. Yeah, as opposed to the wanted ones. Yeah, look, bringing a couple of burgers there, some Taco Bell. Look at these idiots here. All food. They're all dead now. They're all dead. Look at that. Can't even go into your house because uh, there's bull sharks right in there. Guaranteed. Oh, man. Look at that oh, well. crocodile right there. Crocodile. Look at this moron. The only thing that's nice oh, is that you know, oh, like baby. So, so many of those people are, are are you know really used to this kind of thing and they're really good at surviving through it. So look at this dumb shit. Yeah, how stupid can you be? How stupid can you be? Well, you know, I mean I, I would argue that's true for, for any any place in the world where where there's repeated dramatic uh weather that people just seem to put up with and not not move oh look at this this is terrible someone's front porch here yeah great white that that story <laughs> that, that that i heard once on your show that you brought up again tonight um about the the i i could i didn't remember there was a disney cruise but it was a, the disney cruise that rents that that 50 foot uh whale looking creature with the head of a alligator thing yeah remember that where, where where did that story come from uh that one came from i believe max hawthorne okay and that okay. happened in the gulf of mexico okay thank you thank you max hawthorne thank you thank you Dark i, I want to look into that 
I, I love that story. Australia. Now look at this shit. Sharks in the lake. You're telling me that sucker, you can have my golf ball. You can have my golf ball, you dirty bastard. See all these? These we are all bite keep marks. Off. Can there. we keep it? It's kind of cute. Look at this bullshit. I can train it. Look at this. That's just horrible. Yeah, sitting right there, and all of a sudden a bull shark comes up. He's just chilling. It's great. Gotta love Australians. Brave, brave, brave folk. Look at this. You can see the bite marks in the grass here. <laughs> Oh yeah, because probably while the guy was interviewing, he would kept like you know moving his hand, and the shark would bite, and he'd laugh, and he'd move his hand, and the shark would bite, and he'd laugh. He's like, "Oh, it's okay. He's just playing with me. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything by it." That's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Oh my god. So what? what so is, this is just um, this is just the the typical flooding you 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 do. It, expect from the seasonal rains as a result of the <coughs> fires that happened last year. I mean, that's essentially what this is, is right? I would assume so. Yeah, that, that's my understanding. Of it. I haven't looked into it. it. It's actually, it's it's hard to go into mainstream news right now and research anything other than Ukraine. It is absolutely... Yeah, forget about missing cat posters in that neighborhood. River Dogma, you know what's funny? is how many people in my area post missing cat uh, posters. Sad. It's sad. Dude, you go you come to my house into my I'm area. Like a cat person it's sad. <clears throat> well, it's pretty simple, okay? It's pretty simple. In an area that has foxes, coyotes, cougars, bobcats, martens, lynx, okay? You don't go posting, letting your cats outside. They're food, man. An easy food. <clears throat> They're easy food. And you'll see them all on the street signs and at the gas station pinned up. Have you seen little Tiffy here? Miffy went missing. Miffy got out of the... We let Miffy out of the house at, this morning... And Miffy never came back. No, because the mountain lion got him. Your Miffy was not only breakfast, but lunch and dessert as well. In general, I've never understood why people have outdoor animals in places where there are predators. Just flat out. I mean, like, we, we've even had trouble with raccoons getting competitive with our cats, right? When I was a kid. But they weren't hunting the cats. Look, all I'm saying, dude, is this. There are certain... Uh, there are certain things that you don't do. You got to be smart of this. You got to be smarter. I, I, take it, I take it you haven't been to Australia yet? Sorry? You haven't been to Australia yet? Oh no, I'm never going to Australia. That shit'll oh, kill, oh, kill me. Oh, come on. Well, if you if, Dave, if I ever find out that you got the opportunity to go to Australia and you turned it down, I I I will hunt you down, dude. I'll be honest, I would probably you... go. go. I would probably go. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going to use uh I'm going to learn how to walk on uh, stilts so that way if anything happens, Meanwhile, there's, there's snakes winding up the stilts laughing. Oh, isn't he cute? We're going to get him. Oh, look, human on a stick. This is handy. <laughs> yep. Shish kebab. I'll shish kebab myself. It's terrible. Who does that? I tell you, Honestly. we've... We've got... We've got to... I, 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 need, I need to look up at this woman. And get them to your get them to your fantastic booking people because there's this magnificent woman I've told you about her before and she she talks to animals or she claims she talks to animals but she doesn't talk to domestic animals she only talks to wild animals 
And like, there is an amazing special on her out on the web where she like basically saves the life of this black Panther. I've seen because, that. Yeah. That I've woman. Seen... Yeah. That it woman. Didn't, it didn't like its name. Damien it didn't like his name. Exactly. That woman. Right. So that woman, she talks to, she, she has in her house, she has water that she keeps outside for the bees. When it runs out, one of the bees tells her. Yeah. Tells her they need water. Right. But here's the big deal about her. She talked to a shark. And she actually gave the most plausible, sensible explanation for what the hell's been going on this whole time that I've ever heard. And I wanted it on your show and I wanted to say it to you, but I'm going to say it here anyway, because I brought it up and it'd be me not to. Uh, basically what the shark says is, look, when, when we're in those waves, we're hunting. That's like apex excitement for us. <coughs> we're like in kill mode looking for seals. When we see you on the wave with us, our immediate assumption is that you're competing with us for that prey. So we don't like biting you. We don't like it when we waste our time by it. It's actually really annoying. And oh, by the way, you taste like crap. And they pass to her the taste of human flesh, which she said that she agreed it was not pleasant. And they explained that if we would just stay the bloody hell out of the waves and we didn't Bingo. sell surfers in that themselves are all testosterone out. Basically, what we have is we're putting, taking two apex predators in a way and putting them on the same wave at the same time and then wondering why shit happens. Look, I'm not demonizing the sharks here. Okay. I like oh, no, sharks. No, not you, Dave. No, 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 no. no. Dave likes sharks. <clears throat> oh, they just need to know their place which is in the water, which is why Dave doesn't go in the water. It's stupid people who go in the water. Do you know, do you know about shark skin? About how, how, it, how it's impacted scal uh, scalpels? No. Do you know about this? So, so no. it, sharks don't get skin cancer. I mean, they do like under very rare circumstances, but for the most part, they don't get skin cancer. And nobody could figure out why, right? They don't get any kind of skin anything, right? And so it turns out that they, if you go down to their skin, they have all these patterns cut in their skin that basically break up all the little pockets of bacteria or anything that gets on them and keeps them ever from combining into bigger things. And so someone took scalpels and laser etched the same pattern onto the scalpel and then sent a normal scalpel and this scalpel into a, an ER for eight hours. And the scalpel that was etched came back with like 98% less germ development on it. Pretty damn cool. That's good. <clears throat> Hold on. Ozzy Rob, that's good ham hock right there. Very good ham hock. What is ham hock? Huh? What is that? Oh, it's just a personal joke. Oh. Do you see Pat Robertson today? Oh, yes. I was so oh, pleased. Frick. Oh, I could not. I mean, honestly, like sometimes, you know, like reality just brings us a gift, you know, just like a hand delivered. Ta-da! Just for yeah. your entertainment. Please enjoy. Like he was in, he was in form. Like he How was is he not dead his, yet? He's like 170. Well, How is he I tell yet? you, in my opinion, I mean, I, you know, if anyone's been selling their soul to anybody. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. He goes on to say, for people who don't know, he goes on to say that Vladimir Putin is compel compelled by God to invade Ukraine. And, and then it's all in preparation for the massive Eden Times invasion of Israel. Yep. yep. And he even <clears throat> goes on to say that, that 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 Putin himself might be doing this Ukrainian invasion for evil reasons. But what he doesn't know is that it's actually God forcing him to do it for good reasons. Because this is going to allow this other event afterwards to happen. 
So, I just, he just I needs mean, to die already. No offense. It, I don't it, wish it, death upon anybody, but he needs to go away. He shouldn't be it, allowed in front of a microphone. No, but let me. But 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 you know what though? You know what though? I will. I will say this. It, it, am I correct? Is he one of the only ones that, through his entire career, did never did he ever get mixed up in any kind of a sex scandal? I think he's one of the only ones that didn't. I know. I know the prick is worth about a mil, hundred million dollars. I mean, the one thing I will say is is that you you gotta you gotta give him some points for consistency and 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 conviction. I mean, you know, I mean, he he, he that boy man, he he plays that role real well. Um, uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is that you know we all got to play the roles we get, and and he plays his very 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 well. But yeah, I was surprised his handlers let him out, and I was surprised that whoever filmed that. Then afterwards went, yeah, let's put this on the web. Of, I think they do it out of comedy now, to be honest. Oh, I don't know. I think they do it out of comedy. I mean, think about it. He's oh. literally old. I mean, he's old enough to have fought in the Civil War himself, right? Wouldn't it be awesome if just like one day he came on TV and then just did what, what all those people think and just – just unzipped it and just pulled it the flesh off, and he was he was like some like 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 you know like a lizard creature. <laughs> so oh awesome. man, <laughs> that'd be so awesome. He just drives uh, me really baddie. Oh, that'd be so awesome. That would make me so happy. Oh my goodness, he is just yeah. a horrible human being. He's um horrible he's human being. he's um <coughs> yeah he's. <coughs> He, yeah, he is. Well, he, he's, well, let me put this way. When I was a Christian and, and, I, and before when I was a Catholic, uh, I did not consider him to be like a good uh, spokesperson for my, for my group. <laughs> By any means whatsoever. Oh. Uh, yes. Just a horrible uh, human being. But the thing is, is it, is it, to me, like, you know, it, it's kind of like, like if you have a um, like a, a, a really religious, um, say like um, well, let's say Islamic individual, right? It, and they're and they're in their own they're in their own country, and and maybe they are too strict, maybe they are this and that, but but they are that way very consistently, even with themselves, and they have been for a very long period of time, right? To me, that's different. What what, what almost bothers me almost exclusively are the people that, that put all those constraints on everyone else and then themselves live in this disgusting hypocrisy of, of, of fringe benefits and, and, and exclusions and exceptions and, and all this stuff that that's what, that's what drives me nuts. Like that's what just gets under the skin. So Holy it's shit. like, you know, if, if, if he's, you know, if, if he's actually staying true to his word all this time, yeah, it's it's true to crazy, but hey, it's consistent crazy. Watch this. Watch this. That is a Moab, man. Whoa, what building was that? That's uh, the Parliament building in Kharkiv. Jeez. Watch that again. Look at these people just driving, and then boom. Holy cow. <clears throat> that was... No, that was not... That was not the, the dangerous one. Um, but that was a big one. That was a, that was a significant ordinance. Um, that killed some people. The, the 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 really big one that we all have to be concerned about um, does things to the air in the in the region around it, it, it at that nation so it's not pleasant not pleasant at all I tell you you know 
if I don't know, I don't even know if they have these in Canada, Dave. I assume they do, but I don't know for sure if they do. And honestly, I don't even know what you have to do to get into one. Come to think of it, but if by any by any rare weird set of circumstances you ever have a chance to go to a military trade show, okay? So I mean, like a a, a marketing event, you know, like a trade show where it's all very kind of you know showy and um, you know polished, and it's all about selling like company vision and company, you know, like that kind of stuff, but for military weapons, it is, it is a truly awe-inspiring experience because, you know, if you're aware of everything else we're looking at right now, you, you know, the end game to what they're selling. If you don't, then it actually comes off as really normal like you would any other tech trade show, right? There are booths, they have gear in them. You can walk up, you can ask for a data sheet. You can, you can talk to the engineer. They'll do a demo for you, or maybe they won't because they can't, because it would blow up half the building. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, and so it's all, it's like a very normal trade show, but you're walking around and like, instead of like, like, a bunch of computers or uh, like a VR station. It's a, a missile system, you know, it's very weird. Actually, I have, I have pictures of one that I went to that I, I actually can, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can find some. I'll send them to you, Dave. It'll make, you'll make you laugh. It blows your mind. Very weird. But then when you see this and you're like, wow. So at some point, like that bomb that blew up that building, that bomb had a product manager. And that bomb had engineers. And that bomb had someone who was concerned about it, it being built right and doing well. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's such a weird concept to think of it that way. It is. Like there was a salesperson that at some point went to the military and said, have I got a solution for you? You know, you know, what's funny? it's funny. Cheap. You know, what's funny is if you look at what's trending on my, I don't follow American politics I don't follow wrestling. I don't follow a lot of this shit, yet it keeps popping up. <clears throat> it keeps popping up on my damn feed. Well, what's interesting about that, Dave, is that what that really means is that some algorithm is doing some rather clever digging on you. Because if someone were to ask me, I would say that you were interested in wrestling. weird right i mean you are so that's accurate mm -hmm. what what devices do you own that can listen to you like your phone do you have anything else uh no just my phone here my microphone If you basically just like um, strung together like a bunch of audio of a bunch of like Victoria's Secret commercials or um, or something like that and like just played it for your phone, there's a really good chance that for a while you would just see lingerie ads. Oh, man. What a human. What a dude. Oh, look at that. Just lying in front of a tank. He stopped a tank. I'm telling you, these. I'll tell you who I feel sorry for is these Russian soldiers here. They don't even know what the fuck they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> nope. Nope. One bullet. That's all we need. One did see, bullet. Did you, see, did you see the text conversation that went on? It, it's it's you know it's it's hard to tell whether any of this stuff is is authentic or propaganda, but assuming this is real, it's actually a, a text message. It was a text exchange that was going on between a Russian soldier and his mom, right before oh, he, he died. Saw that. It's 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 impactful in a in a good way. Like it's I mean yes, it's sad and it is sad, but what you really walk away with that is awe. You, you, you're in awe realizing that when that kid died, he honestly had, was completely confused as to what he was doing.
Yeah. He, re- he was really confused. That's 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 insane. Like that is just that is just mad. I mean, I'm I don't I have no idea what what's involved in be, in joining the armed services in 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 Russia, but you know uh, whatever method you get into the military, if if you have agreed to lay down your life for for the military, the military has somewhat of a responsibility to make sure that you are well informed and and uh, and have the right gear for what you you're trying think. to do, right? You would um, think. Um, and it's not to say that the Russians don't have a history of unfortunately undersupplying their 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 front lines, but um, you know it's just. Um, well, did you did you see the one tank driver going house to house, begging for food and, and gasoline so they could well, continue? Th- there was two. There was two guys that went in. This is hilarious. Two guys sit in the picture, sitting there handcuffed, right? They're handcuffed yeah. because their tank ran out of gas. They went into a police station. To try to get more gas, a Ukrainian police station. <laughs> they said, "No, but we would like you to stay if you don't mind." <laughs> oh my goodness! And the thing is that you know, you had, you had you had people before saying that this conflict wouldn't happen because there's too much love between the the, the local people, right? And to a degree, they're right. To a degree, they're right, and to a degree, that's what we're seeing, and why we're seeing what we're seeing, right? Because there is much more acknowledgement between the peoples as to their humanity and so forth, um, which just makes it so much more, you know. I mean, it's just. I mean, the number of. Um, I mean, I, I I think I sent you that one video where like um, the guy pulls up to the Russian tank that's out of gas, and and mm-hmm. and. And says, "No, I don't have any gas, but if you'd like, I can give you a ride back to Russia." <laughs> I saw that one. I saw that one. <laughs> All right. On that note, we got to. I want to so say good. a big thank you to Tim, Ed, Michael, Stephen, Thomas, and Dry Toast for the amazing super chats, and uh, <clears throat> and I want to say a big thank you to. Everyone tuning in, Geraldine and Roscoe, the spiritual you tomorrow night. And uh, I look forward to Geraldine as I do every month. She is just one of the most amazing people in this field. Uh, Don't forget, everyone, go support Lynn Wallington's new channel, Rebellious Ufology. She's going to do some amazing work there. No, she is not leaving Spaced Out Radio. She loves us. We love her. And she, you know, we encouraged her to go and do her own thing and get her own channel up and running. And we want to make sure that we can all support that so she can get it monetized and and uh, going there for herself uh, because Lynn is just awesome that way. Thank you, Ozzy Rob, adding to tonight's total. Appreciate that. Watch out for them sharks, buddy. And uh, you know what? <clears throat> We're having a, a great night. Don't forget, if you haven't already, subscribe to our Canada's Great Unknown that's a great channel of storytelling there. And, uh, yeah, we're going to call it the night here, boys and girls. That's the way we do it. Later. I'm going to bed. Always fun. Thanks for... Hold on, I screwed up.